All righty, guys. Uh, we are joined by one of our earliest guests um, back when uh, we were experiencing terrible computer issues. Uh, I think we had very, very few uh, subscribers, uh, but we're, we, we've got the wild carrot back. Yep, already got the uh, wild carrot uh, emojis popping up in the chats. Uh, yep. Uh, so we've got Mr. Jim Shorten back, and we're going to kind of treat this episode, if you will, call, call it an episode, kind of like uh, Mr. Jim has not been here before, considering uh, many of the new viewers maybe not maybe didn't get to ask questions or would like to ask questions. So we're going to let him cover his history as well as, uh, well, all of his history, quite frankly, because he's got a very unique uh, military career in history, uh, even before SOG. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to close my door. That's fine. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to let Mr. Jim get, uh, his bio over, uh, speak about his bio, get into, uh, into Vietnam. And then, uh, we're going to speak a little bit about his first, uh, real combat and tour of duty, if you will, with a 502 and, um, the fellow Sogman that he met there that he would later meet at CCC. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, go ahead and hand it off to Mr. Jim and let him get started. Mr. Jim, thank you for joining us. And uh, the floor is yours, sir. Well, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I, uh, I was born in Liverpool, England, and um, I was born back in 1946. So, uh, but I left, uh, left England when I was around 11 years old at the oldest part and uh, came to the, lived in New York and all over the country. And so when I was like about 15, 16 years old, I ran away from home, quit school. I had a a bad um, uh, childhood with our stepfather. And he's the one that actually took me a name of the name of Jones. My birth name is actually Short 10. So when I left the military, I switched it back to Short 10 because I'm a junior to carry on my father's name, who was in the uh, the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy during World War II. My mother was a donut dolly and that's how they met. So um, after I ran away from home and everything, uh, when I was 17, I decided to go join the Navy, to go see the world. And um, my mother signed for me and a priest signed for me. And um, my first duty station was in Litchfield Park, Arizona, and it was a naval air station. I took up flying airplanes and skydiving while I was there. And uh, I was a dental technician there. Then I left and went to Norfolk, Virginia, and I was on a pre-commissioning detail for the AGMR-2, which was a, a communication ship. They put antennas on top of the deck of a aircraft carrier. and from that took forever. So I went on our, I worked on tugboats for, uh, uh, you know, about, I don't know, maybe six weeks or so. And uh, when they're shorthanded and I loved working on tugboats, hard work, but I really, en I enjoyed it. And then I went on a cruise over to the uh, Mediterranean and spent Christmas over in Italy, Spain, France, and um, then came back. And when I came back to the States, they were looking for a levy to go over to uh, Da Nang, Vietnam on shore duty. And so I volunteered to go there. So I, I went on over and I spent 22 months in Da Nang. And um, I was there when they, they, they uh, when the enemy fired a lot of uh, 122 millimeter rockets into the Air Force base, they hit the bomb storage. The bomb storage blew up and when it blew up, it, it actually picked up a five ton dump truck, picked it up over some trees and dropped it into a barracks. And uh, I, when I was going out there, my truck got blown off the road uh, as well. And um, I was going out trying to get civilians out of the villages and getting them out of there. So uh, that happened. And um, that end, I ended up in the hospital for that. And then uh, I got the enemy poisoned our water and I ended up in the hospital for that. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's when I was in the Navy there. So um, when I... Um, uh, left the Navy. I spent there. I learned this. The, ha, uh, have a working knowledge of the Vietnamese language when I was there as well. So I had a girlfriend. I spent 22 months there, and then when I came back to the States, I decided to join the Army, and I went into um, uh, Special Forces. I signed up for Special Forces as a civilian. Took my battery test. Uh, I had to pass all my other, you know, tests to get into it. And um, so from there, I went in the uh, Fort Ord for 
um, basic, you know, uh, boot camp, not boot camp, that was Navy, um, basic training. And then when I went to advanced infantry training uh, at Fort Ord, I was the outstanding trainee of the, um, of the cycle. I got that, I got an award, I think, I thought I had it sitting up here, but maybe I don't, I don't know. But I had a, I had a, I got a certificate and, um, and I got that little statue. And so from there, I went to uh, airborne school and that was a piece of cake for me because I was already skydiving and everything. And uh, from there, I went to, um, uh, to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I, I went through phase one. Uh, that, that, was, that was okay. Uh, then I went through the MOS training, which uh, first they put me in communications and I had a hard time picking up that ditty dum dum ditty. And so when I finished that, uh, well, I didn't finish it. I asked them to get me out of it. I was going to fail. And I told them, I said, look, you know, I said, I, I worked with the CBs over in Vietnam at Cargo Handling Battalion too. I said, uh, I got working knowledge of Vietnamese language. I said, put me in engineers. So they took me out of combo and put me in engineers. And that was a piece of cake for me. I was always good in mathematics. So um, I did that and then went into phase two. And from phase two, I, I called up Pentagon, talked to Billy Alexander, Mrs. A, and said, hey, can you get me back to Vietnam? And she goes, well, don't do anything foolish. I'll get you back there. And I was the last guy in my class to get orders. And I was the only one that went directly to Vietnam. Uh, a lot of the other, about half the class, some of them, a lot of them went to Germany for the 10th group. Uh, but uh, a lot of them went to like the, there was the sixth group on the smoke bomb hill. They had the sixth group, the seventh group, the fifth group and the third group were all there at Fort Bragg. So a lot of them went to those other groups that were there and, um, they went ahead and, uh, cross trained. And after cross training, they, a lot of them went back, went over to Vietnam. But, um, so when I went to Vietnam, uh, my first duty station was with, um, uh, uh, a 502. And um, what I did is I first got there, I went through the COT, C, they call it the COC course, COC, Combat Orientation Course. I went through that and I talked to a Sergeant Major and said, you know, I'd like to go to Da Nang. And while I was running around town there, I ran into a, a native Indian from India. And um, he was telling me how um, Da Nang wasn't that, um, that much fun anymore. He said, it's not, it's no place to go. So when I was there, I ran into a guy that was at a 502 and he came he said he says i'm leaving he says it's the best duty station you can get so i went ahead and went down to headquarters and i asked this guy named mike micah and i said hey i want to go to a 502 i hear there's an opening and he goes if anybody's going to a 502 i'm going and i said well dang you know <laughs> so i go back to the bar and i'm sitting there and um, micah comes walking in and he goes guess what jones he goes we're both going to go to a 502 so, but Mike Micah just stayed at the camp. He really didn't go out in the field or he didn't do much. But when I was there, they put me on a little outpost called Suyao, which was uh, halfway between the, the main camp, which was north of Natrang, actually. There's a road. When you go to Cameron Bay, you have to go um, north out of Natrang and you go over around the mountains, the Dongbo Mountains, and then you go south into uh, Cameron Bay. And my outpost was halfway between on the other side of the Dongbo Mountains. It's way out there. And so I went on out there and um, stayed with a guy named, um, oh, heck, what was it? Hefferman, uh, Bill Hefferman. And Bill got a commission to become an officer. And so uh, I was there for a couple of weeks. When I went back to the main camp, our uh, CO said, um, well, we're going to put you uh, someplace else here. And I said, well, I'd like a file too. Why don't you let me just stay there? He goes, well, you haven't had enough time in country. I said, Are you kidding me? I've got over two years here. So, and I got a working knowledge of the language. And so he says, well, we'll try it out. And Bill gave, he gave me a plug and said, yeah, he'll be okay. He gets along great with everybody. So I went on down to a 502 and I was the only American there. And I stayed there for, until the camp turned over. And it was probably, we were only there for like about four months. And then the, uh, it turned over to regional popular forces. This is when they started to cut back on special forces in Vietnam. So they, um, when I was down there, the um uh the enemy would hit the camp about every day and a half i mean they'd shoot into the camp just trying to see if we're awake or asleep and uh, uh they would send guys down every once in a while that are new in country so they can get a feel of what it's like to get shot at and that sort of thing so but then one time they tried to overrun my camp and um 
when they tried to overrun it, I had chain link fence around all my bunkers. I had concrete in all my sandbags. Um, uh, I mean, the camp was well fortified. I had food gas sitting out there, which is like a napalm and 55 gallon drums. I put that out there. I had to make it. I dug up the ground, put them in the, under the ground, and I put them in all my avenues of approach coming into the camp. And uh, so the enemy one night decided to hit me with about 60 some odd mortars. Uh, I found 60 shipping plugs, so it had to be more than 60 mortars. But they just peppered that whole camp and around it, hit the wire and everything with mortar rounds. And then they started coming out of the woods, coming towards me. And I had flares up. I could see them coming. And uh, I had my guys firing all their automatic weapons towards them and everything. And then I went ahead and I blew the food gas. And the food gas evaporated on me. but it blew a great big white cloud and it, the whole cloud just lit up like fire but uh, the the food gas was actually gone but it scared the enemy and they turned around and left so uh, that's how i turned away that ground attack um and then uh we when we turned it over to regional popular force i we i took off and went to the main camp and and then we started running little missions running out there into the the field and uh, i i joined up with um a couple of the guys, it was Jim Roush, who was a former CCS guy, and uh, he was there. He he got a bullet. He caught it up here in his eye, and it went back here, and he had this eyebrow that went up on one side. Uh, yeah, you can see it there in that on that little eyeball there, on his other eye. Yeah, yeah, on the other eye. There you go. You see his eye, eyebrow going up, and that's me on the far left, and that's uh, Don Bemis, and then the other, that's me, and that's Don Bemis, and the other guy is Sonny Hoffman, and uh, we formed a little team called the Phantom Team. So we went out there and we were getting ready to, to uh, that this night, actually, we were getting ready to go set up an ambush by the railroad tracks because we knew the enemy was using the railroad to bring supplies through and stuff. So uh, I'm sitting there talking to Jim Roush and I go, what are they putting a claim? Hey, those aren't, those aren't our guys. Those are bad guys. So he goes, where? So I put a, like a dummy, I took out my magazine and put a magazine of tracers in there. And I got down and I started firing. I was right there and started firing. And because it was getting dark. And so I fired all the tracers, which you don't want to do. Uh, what I did is I marked my own position and all the enemy were shooting at me. So <laughs> and so a bullet hit right in front of me. It picked up a, a piece of wood is the only thing I can think of. A piece of wood from a limb. And the limb came up and smashed me right in the friggin' face and knocked me for a loop. And uh I, I laid on the ground. I go, I'm hit, you know, like that. And Jim came over with this with a red flashlight because the firefight lasted probably about 20, 30 seconds. But then he, he went ahead and put the flashlight on me. And um, he goes, oh, you're going to have one heck of a shiner. He says, but you're going to be OK. And I go, whoa, I wonder what it was that hit me. So but um, so anyway, uh, that was uh, the first time my my first time getting actually hit by the bad guys. Um, I mean, other than, you know, being shot at and stuff, but they never hit me. So, but uh, yeah, that was kind of interesting. And we ran a lot of missions. We ran a lot of missions. I mean, I'd go out for a week running missions and uh, come back in and I'd be having breakfast. And our, we had a major in charge of our E-team since it was like 50 some odd guys on there. So we'd go out and run all these missions and stuff. And um, I, I, I'd I came back from the mission. I'm sitting there having breakfast and the CEO comes in. He goes, I need some guys for another mission. And nobody wanted to go. And so I said, well, I'll go. He goes, didn't you just get back? I go, yeah, I just got back. I don't care. I'll just put some more food. Let me finish my breakfast. I'll change my clothes. Go get some more food for my rucksack and take off. And um, so I did. And I'd go out for like about a two-week mission, come back in again and did it again. Went out for another <laughs> one-week-long mission. And... Um, but a lot of the guys, you know, a lot of guys on eight teams, a lot of them don't want to, they don't want to go out in the field. They'd rather just sit back and drink beer and party. But, um, which is kind of sad, at least at A502. But a lot of the guys were older, you know, they, they, they served their time in other places and stuff. So, um, but that's pretty much how the A team worked. And there was something else I was going to say there too. Um, well, if you don't mind me asking a quick question, um, like this photo, uh, this is clearly in the jungle. Uh, yes. And uh, another photo I'm going to show up where you're on another mission. Uh, it looks like y'all are near the coast, but also on a mission. Um, what, well, the train where, is where, on the coast. Okay. Where, where, how far were, were you strictly focused 
on the train, how far away. Um, I've got some photos of the Dongba Mountains uh, that you just mentioned where y'all were near, but how far were y'all going away from the train to, uh, in missions and working? Well, we worked all around those mountains and my camp was on the other side of those Dongbo Mountains. And so I would work out further to the west from there. Um, the uh, They had a Recondo school in the Trang and they would work out in those areas too, but they only did it when, their when the class was graduating. And then they would, before they graduated, they went out on a mission. So they, they would do that. And I used to support them. I had a 4.2 meet uh, mortar and a 4.2 inch mortar. And um, sometimes I couldn't reach them. So what I would do is uh, I'd pour a half a cup of gas down the tube and then I'd have all the cheese, you know, all the charges. We just call them cheeses, but they, it looks like Swiss cheese. I just put those on there and I just dropped the sucker down and it blew it even further. So with that half a cup of gas, so it, it'd get out there and go, well, that went over us, you know? <laughs> so I'd walk it back a little bit until the, the train can get their eight inch gun going. If they got their, their, their um, 106s, I think they were, I think that's what the artillery weapons were. Uh, they wouldn't reach them from the train, but their eight inch gun could. And once, once they got their gun going and then I would go ahead and stop and then they would take over. So, well, Cause they get you... in contact with the enemy out there. Um, I've found a great site that uh, I need to send you, although you probably know it, uh, the Ross Jewelry Company. That's a funny name because it's strictly focusing on detachment A502. But were oh, you at wow. the were, were, were you at Camp uh, Trung Dung? No, Trung Dung was um, was on the south. It was uh, south of uh, Natrang. It was, it was on the south side of the Natrang by the airport there. The airport's right on the coast and it mm -hmm. was south there. Um, oh wait, no, is that Trung Dung? No, that, I, think that's that's the... I think that was Binton. No, Trung Dung is where the main camp of A502 is. And it's an old French fortress, fortress and it looks kind of like a star, like a mm. half star. And uh, that's when they had a road going into Trung Dung. Yeah, that was the main camp. That's right. Okay. I, uh, I have to dig deep to get all this information out. So I think I've got the main, uh, Let's yeah, there's see. some aerial photos of it and stuff. Yeah, that's strong. Yeah, that's the main camp. Okay, and you and did you just say uh, you you were, you said something about having uh, uh they had old cannons? I've got a, a picture right here. Uh, old, I think old, of the old caimans. What's old caimans? The the cannons, cannons. I'm sorry. Oh, the old can yeah, no, uh, Trungdung didn't have any of those cannons or anything. Well, there's an old cannon sitting. That that's not working. That's just sitting there. That's the yeah. I think that's an old French cannon that they kept. Yeah, it's an old French fort. Oh, okay. There you go. Then that okay. Wow. Did you ever cr go there at any time, or were you strictly at your? Uh, yeah, uh, I went there uh, every Monday. Every Monday, I'd go up there and uh, I'd change my clothes and I'd go downtown to go get late or something, you know. So. But I'd, I'd drive the Jeep down to the, the headquarters and leave the Jeep at headquarters. And then I'd walk out the gate and take a jitney or something, you know, some little Vietnamese guy on a bicycle. And then they'd take me on downtown. And I'd go spend time with my uh, my girlfriend down there. Oh, wow. OK. Um, the, uh, and well, two questions. First, so this is, 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 here's is the main it, camp. And on the left side is that picture where you showed the, the offices where they had the special forces group headquarters or something yeah and then yes. on the other, other side uh there was a back in the corner there there was a bar and um i remember one time i was walking down when i was going through training group um i think it was phase one we just got done killing our goat and stuff and getting ready to cook it and stuff anyway uh, there was a guy in there tom jones and tom jones uh, had a cat and the cat was always getting sick on everybody's bed so the cadre wow. asked me to take the cat out and kill it so I took the cat out, which is sad. I love cats now. I really love cats. But I, I went ahead and um, I killed the cat. I cut its head off, its tail off, its feet off. I put it on a spigot and I'm cooking it. And um, Tom Jones comes walking through the jungle or through the through the woods there. And he goes, um, hey, where'd you get the rabbit? I said, oh, we snared him out there. He goes, mm. Not bad. I said, why don't you come back later and have some? He goes, OK. So he came back later and he had some. And uh. so so. <laughs> So when I'm walking down, I'm coming out of the bar, walking out towards the gate and Tom Jones is walking towards me and I'm, I go, Hey Tom, how you doing? He goes, you asshole. I go, what? I go, you asshole. I go, what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. 
And I go, well, who told you? It doesn't matter who told me. I said, well, how about if I buy you a beer? He goes, okay. So he went and had a beer and stuff. But uh, that was probably one of the crummiest things I ever did is I had him eat his own cat. <laughs> the, I, well, one, the, the, the big question would be, was the cat any good? Was it uh, w- w- oh, yeah. worth? Yeah, cat's, okay. cat's uh, pretty, yeah, cat's good. So is dog. Okay. I eat a lot of dog. Uh, I've, yeah, I've, I've, a lot of dogs. I've heard that and would definitely, uh, as a matter of fact, this is y'all drinking right here. Let me get this photo up. Uh, b- numerous of the CCS guys that we've had on uh, had issues with the dogs tripping flares and and, and issues like that. Oh, and, I um, can see that. Yeah, we didn't have they, that problem, but yeah, I can see that. They resorted to uh, doing uh, wild dog hunts for the mountain yards, and finally some of the mountain yards got them to uh, – to, to to try some and they some of the guys actually enjoyed it uh, uh they yeah it's, they, it's good dog is really good they were quite um, surprised me on the far left and that's toby todd on the far right and i can't remember the guy in the middle there but yeah, this I is think, that albert's bar let me that's see if the, this is this says this might be uh to me that does not look like uh yeah this is definitely mislabeled because it's got still got you jim roush and sonny hoffman i I thought that may have been uh, uh, Spider Parks at first, but I don't think he was at FOB two at all no, at, no, he at, during your yeah. yeah during your time. So I I was always trying to figure out who exactly that was, but that's clearly Mister Toby, like you said back there in the back yeah. uh, back corner. Great, great, great and man. And I think oh. um, Ralph Rod, I think, is uh, the one that took the picture. I, I think I think it was a credit, and I gosh, I wish we could know. It's not uh, Galen Musselman because he was awful. No. Sh- he was he was he was short. Uh, yeah. that, that's a pretty big, stocky guy, and I can't tell if he's an officer or a recon man. But oh, he's, he, he's a sergeant. Okay, wow. Maybe we can find out. I'll post that in the group page, and we still got to get you in our uh, in our group page on on Facebook because we've got all of uh, your your partners in crime, Mister uh, Mister Dan Stir and uh, John Good, and and all the guys on there. Um, yeah, um, Dan Stir was my one zero when I first went to CCC. He was the one zero of RT Delaware, and they then when I got up there, they asked me, uh, you know, if, they sent me over to there and uh, to RT Delaware, and so Dan and I, I was his one one, the assistant team leader, and because I had about thirty five missions or so out there in A five hundred two, I was constantly going out in the field, so. Uh, and I learned how to call an aircraft and do all that stuff. So I was really good at calling aircraft, calling an air support and all kinds of stuff and getting people out and directing aircraft. So um, I went ahead and um, uh, when we came, we had a mission and we almost got we almost got over uh, uh, captured. I mean, they were all over us. They were chasing with dogs and everything. And so when we came back uh, after about three days of running our buttons off, what happened? <clears throat> we were supposed to go in outside of a regiment, a battalion and walk through and try to gather intelligence and what happened is the the old french maps aren't that good and so the pilots actually put us in between them and they let us land and then they tried to capture us so um we ran our butt off for quite some time we got away from them and um, finally on the third day they decided to get us out of there they kept saying break contact continue mission so but they uh, they finally uh dan blew an abatis on a tree and then I ran out the tree and got up on, you know, because the Navatees is where the tree still connected. So they used that during World War II. They they bowed Abatees on a road. So if any of Germans were chasing them or something like that, they couldn't go around it. Mm-hmm. And they'd have to they'd, they'd get away because it takes time to cut the tree down. So um, but I did that. And when I got on the chopper, you know, I was first out with uh, I had two mont yards with me or three of them. They got on the chopper and um uh, and then I'm getting on the chopper and the, and they started taking off when I was getting, I was on the strut and I'm hanging on the strut and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, does anybody see me here? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so finally the yards, one would lay over their legs and the other guys would reach way down, you know, to get out there and grab my arm. And then they pulled me in. Then I got my leg around the strut and climbed in, but, uh, I was probably about four or 500 feet in the air by the time they got me in. So it was a, it was it was a pretty scary moment. I could have been killed in my very first mission. But um, after that mission, Dan decided to get out of recon, and then I took over RT Delaware as a team leader. Um, I was probably one of the earliest guys to become a team leader on there. 
Uh, most guys run many missions and don't become team leader, team leaders, or they even don't even get into, uh, uh, you know, they, a lot, you know, in CNC, there wasn't that many teams that ran, uh, there yeah. might be five, five or six teams that ran missions all the time. The other teams didn't have team leaders and a lot of guys didn't feel they were ready to be team leaders. So they, they never became team leaders. Um, they came and asked me if I wanted to take over the team. And I said, yeah, I'll take it. You know, um, it's kind of scary. Uh, I talked to Tilt Myers, you know, John Stryker Myers about it. I said, you know, Tilt, uh, I said, when I used to fly out with those guys going in on a mission, I'm sitting there going like, what am I doing here? I have no business with these guys, you know, but like he says, everybody thinks the same way. They don't think they're ready, but if you know what you're doing, you know how to handle a, a battle and a fight and everything and what to do with your guys, how to take care of them if they get wounded, how to call an aircraft and everything else and air support, then, you know, you're pretty much ready, you know, so you just bite the bullet and go do it. And that's what I did. Gosh, almighty. And I was uh, I was getting some photos together uh, since we're about to get get fully into SOG. But I was curious before we cross uh, completely uh, out of a 502 for for the m most part, um, two two parts. Uh, one um, at that point in time, I'm thinking I thought you said 1968, 1969 is when you're at a 502. I think 1969, because training is about a year long. Uh, I joined the Army in 68. So I believe it was probably 69 when I was in A502 and all of 70, and I left in early 71. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, um, I was two months with the Navy in Vietnam, in Da Nang, Vietnam, on shore duty with cargo handling battalion too. And then I was uh, 18 months with, um, and maybe a little longer than 18 months. I don't know. Um, I kept missing my flight coming home. I missed it on the third time the sergeant major had two guys carry me, walk me down to the airport and get on the plane and leave. <laughs> I, 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 I thought mean, I, I, came up, I didn't want to miss it. <laughs> I, I thought I remember. I, I think I remember you saying something. You were actually on your way out to do something or maybe uh, perhaps run a mission or something. And he grabbed he, he immediately snatched you up and we're like, what, what are you doing? You're, you're leaving. And he had two guys with him and um, immediately, uh, made you pack in front and, and, and literally they, they took you to the airplane. <laughs> well, they did that on the way when I came back from the mission. What happened is they were having a POW snatch mission. I used to teach uh, prisoner snatch missions. And so they had uh, our team mama came down. They wanted to go out there. And so I went out with our team mama, which is the CCN team. They came mm -hmm. down for the, how to take prisoners. Cause I took a lot of prisoners when I was mm -hmm. in a 502, I, a 502, I think I took 13 prisoners, no 12 prisoners. That's Mamba right there. That's our team Mamba. And um, I took that when we were out there. This is in South Vietnam where we're training. So we went ahead and um, uh, that night, the next morning, we rested overnight. And the next morning, we heard some people coming up the trail. And uh, so we jumped out there. And, and uh, what, what happened was there were some Australians in the area. And the Australians, they were coming up the socks cart. The Australians uh, went out there and they they got hit by an ambush. They ran into a field and the field had a lot of mines in it. And uh, 36 guys were either killed or wounded. So they asked us to go out there and take prisoners to find out where they are making these mines. So we went out there and underneath all these logs was all these implements of how to make you know metal and stuff to make mines. So what we did is we stopped and then we found there was an nva a couple of Viet Cong with with her uh, it was a female actually and an old old uh Viet Cong guy and he was with and they were like a husband wife team and they had kids with them so what we did is uh uh we told we, we destroyed all the implements and everything we told the kids to take the oxen go back home and um the um uh there was a chopper overhead and he goes uh I want you to get back away from there. We're going to shoot them up. And yeah. I told the chopper, I said, you shoot these kids up and then make you come down here and look at it. And um, a CNC ship, not, not like command and control, like CCC or it's a, it's a control ship that flies around Vietnam. They picked up the one to know what was going on because they could hear me chewing out these pilots. And um, I said, uh, we got a bunch of kids down here and they want to shoot them up. And, and the CNC ship told them to get out of there and leave. So um, they left and then the kids went back, took the, the oxen and they went back to the village. 
and we took the three prisoners and brought them back in. And this was when I was down at uh, B-53 when I was teaching that uh, prisoner snatch. So we took those three prisoners and brought them back and that sort of thing. And that was pretty much the end of that mission. Um, so, but yeah, that uh, the other team that was with us, they didn't get a prisoner. And that was uh, Shepard. And he had, um, I think it was, is it Mike Shepard? Anyway, he had a, uh, he had a, he was down there for training too, but he was up on the hill and he took a siren and he was cranking the siren all night to let the enemy know where he was. Because in Vietnam, it's, it's not that hard to take a prisoner in Vietnam. Um, I mean, you just, because they're usually small groups and you can overwhelm them real easy. And I, when, when, um, when uh, Nui T out of A502 got overrun, I was on the reaction force for it. Um, I've got a bunch of pictures of it too, but I don't, I won't put them on. They're, they're nasty. People blown in half and everything. It's really nasty. When a, when a camp gets overrun, it's pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, arms and legs are gone. Heads are gone. Bodies are blown in half. Chests are blown out. It's, it's horrible when you, because they have these satchel charges and everything and, you know, grenades and stuff. You hit them with that stuff and, you know, they're a mess. But um, when that got hit, we knew the enemy was pulling people out of the wire, taking them up, and they were going back up in the hill, and we knew there was a hospital up on that hill somewhere. So I set up an ambush to go out there and find people going up into that area to find out where the hospital was. And so I picked up a, uh, a nurse, and, um, and I, think, uh, I think it was two NVA and two Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were actually Montagnard, and um, so... But we got those guys and uh, took out the rest. But uh, we got them and brought them back. And and uh, I guess the locals figured out where the hospital was. But we the our CO didn't want anybody going up in there because we we're getting close to regional turning over the camp, and he didn't want anybody getting uh, getting wounded and that sort of thing. So, which I thought was kind of a a bummer. I t I said I'm not worried about that. That goes with the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I figured your chance of getting wounded is like 10% and your chance of dying is 1%. So, you know, so I just took the odds. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's, that's amazing. I, I mean, I, I've heard stories of, of course, since it's a, a, a one zero school is uh, live fire. I mean, it's a tough school. I mean, you, you've got to pass a real mission to, to pass the course. Uh, uh, that that's amazing. Y'all got that on a, on a long time training mission and, and found that. And yeah. especially well, that, was a, while that, was you're... A prisoner. that was a prisoner snatch uh, course. That wasn't a, uh, like a one zero course. Uh, oh, wow. The zero, yeah. The one zero courses are, are, are different. That's when you bring guys down you teach them how to be team leaders. You teach them how to call in and uh, how to call an aircraft, how to call in. Uh, we worked with uh, O2, uh, not O twos, but um, I guess O tens. O tens. They, Sess the sky master the push yeah. push pull push prop pull. yeah and uh, they would have rockets you know and they would they would fire rockets like uh white phosphorus they would fire those down so guys would call them in and, and have to walk it around they'd learn how to do all that sort of thing same with mortars and we teach them how to point and shoot we had these um where you throw things in the air and they just kind of keep both eyes open and shoot we taught all that kind of stuff we taught survival how to lay out claymore mines um you know all that stuff we, we taught them all kinds of devices and stuff so and yeah and ladders i, I worked with infill exfil so i worked the parachuting and uh ladders and strings you know stable rig and all that sort of thing what you don't see in these pictures this is something that people look at these pictures and they go well that looks comfortable but it's not mm -hmm. <laughs> leg will go to sleep you have to hook into those ladders if you notice this one ladder here where you're, the little thing is you notice it's nice straight up and down you look at the other ladder it's kind of like all twisted that ladder is going like this through the air <laughs> and you're being thrown all over the place and you don't see that in these pictures so but uh but yeah that's that's uh, they dropped these ladders and that was a long ladder there you know they they dropped it down through the trees some of the guys would try to climb up a little bit a lot of guys would put all their equipment down and hook it into the bottom of the ladder so it would take in um uh, hold the ladder steady for you and they try to climb up but if, if you're in the middle of a contact or something you're trying to get real quick like i did one time what you do is you just jump on the ladder and snap in with a snap link and and just take off and um 
Yeah, because you want to get out of there. I did it one time on a short ladder, and as he was taken off, I was climbing up the ladder, and I wanted to get in and tell the pilot to look down. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of people don't realize that when they see these pictures. Ladders are horrible. I hate ladders. You fly, you're, you're twisted and thrown all over the place on those things. You had quite a quite a bit of experience, not only teaching, but also did, did, weren't you taken uh, extracted w with ladders quite a few few times? I'm mostly strings. I like strings okay. because I didn't want to go any place where the helicopter could land. Oh. I didn't want to go in any of those kind of like landing zones. I didn't want that um, because as chances are, the enemy knows it's a landing zone. They're going to be there. So I have them drop ropes down between the trees and um, and and just hook up and take off from there. I had one mission when I was at CCC where um, uh, we had to go in and do a body snatch. I was at RT Illinois. I, was, I took over the team for for the bright light mission and uh because uh, steve kiever was the one zero of the team the team leader but he was on a 30-day leave and we we're up there at the bright light stand down waiting for missions in case something hopped up because we we're close to the border up at docto uh he came be bopping up and i go steve what are you doing here he goes um i just got back from leave i heard you guys are up here i thought i'd come up and say hi i go we're going on a mission you want to go and what's he going to say no he can't say no it's his team <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh he goes, well, yeah, I, I guess, you know. And I said, yeah, we got a guy that was killed out in the field. We got to go get his body. And uh, I said, there's about 350 enemy there uh, coming, you know, that they got hit with maybe more. They might have got hit with a bigger element. But um, uh, I told him, I says, I'm just going with two other guys and myself. And he looks at me like, what? <laughs> I, said, I said, we don't have time for two helicopters. He said, all we got is time for one helicopter. So, um what what we're going to do is just go right in we'll repel in and they say they can see the rope in the tree and so we went ahead and just um that's repelling there those guys are repelling uh but and these are the ropes that you know you those ropes on the bottom have um a bag on them you know and it the ropes all in that bag and when it drops it the sandbag or a metal bar or something on the bottom will drop it down and there's two hooks on it and we hook up with it and they just take off with us and so we repelled in and um, <clears throat> and then the chopper, the chopper couldn't get down the ground. He, I mean, he couldn't get low enough. The, the ropes are 120 feet, but they we couldn't get low enough to the ground. Uh, so uh, the chopper just came down, started mowing through the trees, cutting down branches, trying to get us on the ground. And uh, so we got on the ground, unhooked, and this cobra flies overhead. And he goes, Carrot, follow me, because my code name was the Wild Carrot. I had really bright red hair. I still got... I, I only got a little bit of gray right here, but I still got all my own natural hair color. But the, um, anyway, he uh, he goes, follow me. So we walk up the hill, the three of us, and we see the rope in the tree. We go over, we find the body, and we dig him up. And because um, he fell probably about 500 feet or so, but he we dug him up and they had him come back over and drop the same ropes we repelled on. They dropped him down. And we hooked everybody up, you know, I hooked the body up and I'm holding on to the body. And I said, get us out of here because we can hear the enemy yelling and screaming coming after us, you know, like, come on, hurry up, you know, kind of thing. So um, as they're pulling us up through the trees, I look down and I can see the enemy coming and they're shooting at the helicopter because if they get the chopper down, they got us all. So they're shooting at the helicopter and we're shooting down to the bad guys. And finally, we get up a little bit higher and we start to take off and we're probably about four or five hundred feet and um maybe a little higher and a when a when he sky Rider came right down underneath me and about 50 feet under my feet and the pilot just looks at me and just goes like that you know and i just kind of i'm holding on to the dead guy and i just kind of wave to him and i'm sitting there going you know dear god get us out of here kind of thing so but anyway he fired flechettes down there and everything and so then we came on back it was a good mission none of us got hurt the chakra had a few holes in it but uh none of us got hurt and uh, that was a good mission we got the body back out so that was, that, was a, that was a cool mission, but probably one of the smallest uh, bright light missions. <laughs> wow. I mean, in any time uh, with bright lights, uh, it, it's more than likely going to be uh, hairy or just just a, oh, a bad scene. Cause, yeah, because something's wow. gone wrong uh, and, and help's needed. So, God, uh, for y'all to even, you know, that that's one thing that always interests me so much with you. Uh, you're, you're not, you didn't want to land. You, you didn't want to, you didn't want a helicopter on the ground, uh, no. as much as possible. And you, 
out of all the vets I've spoken to, I think you're one, if not the only one that I know, at least I know he has the most, but times repelling uh, into a target and, and actually being successful because a lot of guys were scared to do that. I don't know if it was because they didn't well, trust the equipment. Yeah, I don't think they're afraid to do it. I think they uh, they just didn't like rappelling in, I guess, you know. I, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of guys that don't like to rappel. A lot of guys, I volunteered to do a jump mission. If they wouldn't let me do it, I wanted to go do a jump mission. And they said, no, it's too dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Three months later, they started doing jump missions. And I was down at Long Ton then. And um, they, uh, I, I remember when, um, oh, what's his name? Um, anyway, he came on down. He came down, he was doing some training for a jump mission. And um, I asked him, I said, hey, I, I, I'd like to go with you. He said, you, you have another guy in the team. And he was afraid that the team didn't know me, didn't trust me. They didn't know me, his other team, the rest of his team. So, but he turned me down. I, I would have gone on that jump mission with him in a heartbeat. You know, and, and when I was down there, I made three free free fall jumps when I was down at long time. I made 19 jumps in Vietnam all training uh they were all at long ton except for a few that i made up in dong batin when i was on a502 we had a guy up there that wanted to wear the beret and you know if you're airborne and you're uh, attached to special forces you can wear the beret and it has a crest but there's a little candy stripe underneath it for instead of the whole flash you know yeah that's one of my free fall jumps there at long ton and you can see my hair was nice and red <laughs> wild care not as red as it used to be so but so, um, how many jumps did you say you made while in country 19 good lord it's, i mean three of them were free fall but none, for, none of them were missions they were all uh they were all training and that's what i'm saying uh guys you've got great questions we'll be getting to in a minute and there with with, with you jumping the the way you were and as many times as you 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 jumped that that's amazing that you you weren't ever uh i guess because you were training and maybe you uh because yeah, they were wanting so secret that they 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 thought you might have been seen and and weren't willing to risk it but i mean i i could only imagine as many times you had jumped because that's as much as some of the teams jumped in, in training so i mean that that's wild to think about i mean yeah. you a lot of well, time I jumping out of airplanes well, when I left uh, the Army, I had probably around 80 or 90 jumps. But um, when I left the military, I had between six and 800 jumps. And I did all my jumps as a PJ. You know, when I was in the Air Force as a pararescueman, I, I made as many as six jumps in a day. You know, when they were um, when getting ready to repack all the chutes, we didn't just take them apart and repack them. We, we threw them on a truck. And I'd fly out in the helicopter, the H3 helicopter, I'd parachute in. And um, then we'd just get on the ground. We'd just take another shoot out of the truck, go back up and jump again. And we'd do that a lot. It'd be like maybe five or six of us that would go out there and do it. And, and that's, that's going out the back end of a C-130. And is that uh, a long time? Is that the... the oh, I don't know where this picture was. This, I'm not in this picture, actually. But um, oh, uh, I don't know where this picture was taken. My guess is probably around Fort Bragg or it, it doesn't look like Arizona because, you know, the Halo School in Arizona here is over in, um, oh, heck, it's over on the east side over there and it's all deserty. So I don't think yeah, that's I, there. There's a lot of burn up, but also a lot of that's forested. Trees. Yeah, trees, yeah, that's all there. Forest and trees and stuff. That could be it could be around Fort Bragg all those trees and stuff um but yeah no i i i want to get back into free fall here pretty quick you know it, uh is that what y'all would jump out of every time was the uh at, at long time uh in country was a c-130 jump or did, uh, c-130s or, or the hueys either one okay I, I, that's uh very interesting because mr howard sugar as we spoke about earlier we've got several photos of him and mr bob mcnair uh who uh made a static line jump uh with rt main as a matter of fact but they we've got photos of them and the team getting ready to get on the hueys and go make a practice uh halo jump from from the huey or simulated halo jump if you will yeah a lot well you know well back then it was almost like just skydiving it, it wasn't 
I mean, the packs were small, though they have shorter weapons, you know, and uh, it's not like what you see today with Halo with all the big oxygen and all this, the, all the stuff they got all over them. We, we, it wasn't like that for us. We didn't wear any kind of body armor or anything like that. You know, we just wore shirt, pants, and uh, I wore a bandana around my, not a bandana, you know, a cravat. I tied to cover my red hair. And uh, that, that's about all we wore when we were over there. And, you know, our rucksacks are really, you know, they're small. They're not really big. And you can just strap them on, you know, so it, it's not a, it's nothing like what they do today. The guys today, I mean, when they're going through, uh, what's the name of that place down there where they free fall down in, um, uh, it's on the east, uh, the west side of Arizona, down by the Mexican border, or I guess uh, down by uh, the- Zoom, no, not Zuma, Pat. Yuma. No. It's Yuma. Yuma, yeah, that's it. Down Yuma. Yeah, that's where they do it. And I think the Air Force has that place. A lot of the guys jump here in Arizona. They jump up at uh, Eloy. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them mm -hmm. will they practice up there and they'll jump. I, when I go to Eloy and talk to the guys up there jumping and stuff, uh, I, you know, I go to the bar and I see all their pictures on the wall. I've got a autographs from um, um, Cliff Newman, Sammy Hernandez, and Melvin Hill. And I'm, I'm looking for a good picture of all of them. And I'm going to put the autographs in there and give it to them so they can put that on the wall as the first combat halo jump. I've got a wonderful photo. I'll email you today of them, okay, cool. all three of them lined up together, getting an award. I'll, I'll send you. Good. And then I'll put those autographs in there and they're, they're all in my, my log book. I was, uh, I was in long time when, uh, when they were up at long time practicing for the halo jump. That's what I was wondering if, if you were if you were there at that time. It seems like that was uh, yeah. when you were talking. You were in the same time frame. I've got my uh, memorial uh, first jump uh, play, placard up there that's signed by uh, Sammy, uh, Melvin, and Cliff, and that is a cherished item as well. That's uh, yeah an amazing amazing jump they did. And uh, before we get to some of the questions, because the guys are and and ladies have uh, some wonderful questions coming in. Um, when both at a 502, um, it, it's a two parter at a 502, were you already getting a taste or getting to see or use the car 15 weapon wise? No, we used M 16s there. Um, I carried the M 16 pretty much. I'll tell you a funny thing that happened. I had my M 16. We wore tiger stripes as you saw in that picture. Um, but I cut up, uh, I cut up my old tiger stripes. And I wrapped them around the stock and around the, the hand grip on the M16. And I said, you know, I had to, I can have a nice matching M16 with my uniform. And uh, I was up at the uh, Dahan and um, I think it was Dahan. Was it Dahan? Uh, it's a mission support site up in the Dongbo mountains there, up on the top. And I was up there and we got into a firefight because the enemy would get up, it was like on a little knoll and the enemy would come up above the hill and shoot down at us. And so we're we're in a firefight, and I'm shooting up my M16, and and my friggin' M16 caught on fire. <laughs> Holy cow! Yeah, from you right having there. yeah, where I had the cloth on the front grip, it was close to the barrel, and it caught on fire. My, you know, and the guys would tease me. They go, "Well, that guy's really hot in a firefight, man." I tell you what. <laughs> Holy was, cow! Yeah, my I mean, rifle caught on fire just a uh i mean literally burst into flame i mean it it, it yeah, caught on fire wow. it was so funny it was wow. really funny uh and the the last part of that uh two-parter um when you would make jumps uh i'm not sure uh what the protocol uh, or if you trained as a, a, a combat insert or if you ever jumped with a weapon did you jump with a weapon? Or was it a car 15? I see some of the teams, uh, uh, RT Storter tried all Uzis one time, but most of the guys went with their car 15s. Did you jump with your car 15 or? Um, no, I've made a lot of jumps with M16s. I don't think I've jumped with a car 15. Oh. But yeah, we all, uh, all SF guys jump with uh, weapons and rucksacks and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that that's uh, that's pretty much a given. Wow. Yeah, because okay. that, that's part of your, you know, your training. Okay. I was uh, curious about that. And that, that's got to be wild, uh, you know, uh, not only being secure on a halo, considering how early it is, but utilizing and, and having all your gear properly secured to you and, and jumping with a weapon. You know, that that's uh, 
that's up in the ante as if jumping alone isn't hard enough. So, well, when you wow. get into pararescue and you start jumping with all your scuba gear and wraps <laughs> and medical gear and everything else, yeah, well, that's a bit, little bit different. We, we've got uh, we've got that photo that'll be coming up here in just a bit that I, I want you to talk to because it looks like you're gonna have that you'll ha you'd have to waddle waddle up and that someone just push you out of the aircraft. <laughs> Well, I had one of those one time. I did jump with what's called a Griswold bag. And that's a great big giant bag. It sticks, it probably stands up about three feet high or something like that. And probably about two feet wide, maybe, maybe a little more. It's a great big giant bag. It has a, what they call the red apple on it. It has a big thing that comes up. It's got a red apple in the front. And uh, we were doing a, a Labor Day Leap Fest at uh, St. Mary de Glise in uh, the big jumps, jump zone up there in um, Fort Bragg. And it was a contest. It was um, they were having the Oktoberfest, you know, and a big beer party thing. And so a lot of the teams got together and they competed against each other. And we came in first place in time, but we got dinged because we lost ten points because some one of the guys was missing a piece of equipment, and we didn't know it because they check all your equipment. And one person has to jump with the Griswold bag. So I'm only, you know, I was, I'm five, just under five foot eight. I'm five foot six now. I've lost inches because I'm, you know, I'm going on 78 years old. I just don't look it. But um, anyway, the, uh, I, I got up by the door with this big old Griswold. I, I'm on my toes. This big bag is so huge. And so when uh, I was getting ready to jump and we get over, the guys would, had guys on both sides and they would get their feet and kick the bag out and I'd go out after it, you know, just jump. They'd kick me out. I just followed the bag out and uh and it opened up then you get on the ground and when you get on the ground you got to pick that sucker up and carry it it weighs like i don't know about 60 80 pounds or something like that but you, then you got to carry it up to this the point so your whole thing is getting as close as you can to this point to get your points but that's probably the heaviest thing i've ever jumped with outside of pararescue with scuba gear and everything else yeah here's uh two heavy loads that that's one of them uh your back is ridiculous enough along with your front uh and then there's one that you uh are in a helmet and uh something out now this is para rescue days correct or was yeah, this, this 12. what you're seeing i got double scuba tanks on you know twin tanks there's oh, a parachute God. on the back of it and then underneath that is a raft and then in the front, you got the reserve parachute and you got your all your medical gear and then all the other junk that you got tied to you. And you can That's see the nice. regulator coming around. It's in my hand up there on top of the reserve. How much do you think you weighed right there? I mean, um, uh, it's over 100 pounds of equipment. And uh, let me let me show this one before we get into some questions, because this is also uh the, the a great photo thank god, god someone saw you and took this because look at the gear you, oh yeah got. that's a winter jump and that's all my medical gear in the bottom i'm carrying twice as much medical gear and there's a red apple right there see that on in front of mike gislow is on the on the right side there you see that that's a red apple there and he had one connected it's not a griswold bag but he had the apple the connected to his gear so, but uh, I carried his snowshoes. That's why I'm carrying two sets of snowshoes. We got the helmet and uh, we got the tree suit because we're jumping into the trees. And this was in the winter time up in the up in the Sierras. Oh my God! So, so how much do you think you're weighing right there now? Um, well, that's probably not as heavy. I think that's probably uh, we're probably carrying about I would say maybe sixty pounds of equipment, maybe seventy with, pounds. The most but what you're jumping into is going to be uh, bad news uh with the yeah, cold awesome. and the, oh There's man snow and, snow and freezing and and you're jumping into the trees and stuff uh the, and the, there's gonna be mastering the, the, there's gonna be an interesting one that uh, uh tidbit on one of your jumps that i'd like to speak about in a bit but uh considering we've got some of the some great viewers in here with some great questions. Uh, would you mind if we hit some of the questions? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. Um, Frank may have wrote this out twice. Let's see here. Frank, uh, any or what training on hand to hand uh, combat? I'm presuming specifically for prisoner capture, 
tactics or handling of of a prisoner or i guess he's assuming do, do you have hand did you get hand-to-hand -hand combat training and um, did you use it you get a hand-to-hand -hand combat training when you're in going through basic and maybe a little bit in ait um most of my hand-to-hand -hand stuff was um when i was in the navy they sent me through counterinsurgency training and uh, i trained with um well the instructors not trained with the the udt it was udt back then for and then it became seal teams mm -hmm. well the udt it was in um i guess over by little creek virginia some um was it damn, it's called, neck. Uh, damn neck it was over in damn neck and um which i think is where seal team six is now yes, but sir. they um they put us through uh uh judo some karate when i was in training group in the army i took karate taekwondo and um but that's about the only training you get so wow. did did you uh and it came up uh frank was curious did that come up did you have to use any of that whenever you captured a prisoner or just the mere fact oh. of y'all's violence of action yeah and, yeah when you jump out the i mean you know the enemy just kind of catches their breath and they just give up yeah they know they're doomed so if they know if they run they're dead so wow yeah they yeah, never had a problem with prisoners they just, I never had a problem at all with them. It just took them. How many do you think in handcuffs on them? You know, the tied them, tied them up. That was about it. With I a five, right? I didn't. I never ab uh, abused prisoners. Um, you know, in fact, I, there was one where I was on a five hundred two, and we we took a prisoner. He had he got shot in the leg, broke his femur, and I brought him in. And actually, when I was giving him, um, I was giving him some morphine for the pain. He was a fourteen year old kid. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting there giving him some morphine for his pain. He thought I was actually going to put him to sleep, kill him. kill him, and eat him. He actually thought oh, we were going to eat him because that's what the North Vietnamese was telling everybody. Don't get captured by the Americans. They'll eat you. you know? And uh, I had my guys take him on down to the hospital in uh, Cameron Bay. I went down to see how he was doing because he had a lot of intel on him. So I was going to – I went down to see him, and then I noticed his leg was gone. And then I went down a couple of – a cup about a week later and i said where is he and you go he died and i got into a fight with the doctor i said what happened to him he only had a broken leg he goes you know how many americans i see coming in because of people like him and i go well, you know how many more are going to die because you just killed my intel and and i just got on his case and we were going to get into a fist fight and the nurse broke us up so kid, a kid I, no told, I told him i said he's a 14 year old kid doing what his government's telling him to do he doesn't care about us he's just doing what he's told you know and just you know i said you can live with it now i had a lot of respect for the enemy i mean they can take your life you know but um you know i not... I, I saw i love the vietnamese people they're really beautiful people you know and and uh now going in the sandbox and fighting terrorists that's a whole different ball game i, I wiped them guys right up i mean i wouldn't think yeah. twice about taking them out yeah pure but, evil uh, i i've yeah. i've never in the i guess it's coming up on seven years this year that I've spent, luckily, being able to speak to all of you SOG vets that I've spoke to, and I've never, uh, not once, heard of a uh, 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 SF or a SOG man uh, abusing a prisoner, a wounded soldier, uh, what have you, out of, even if on a, on, when an ambush went bad and they got the prisoner and he may have killed somebody on the team, uh yeah. he, he, they even kept the mountain yards from 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 killing the the prisoner because they had killed a mountain yard before so I, i've so that i've that's one thing i always get straight when i i do get comments occasionally on here about uh you, you know your your sharing history of, of of killers and all that and i quickly have to put people in their place and and let them let them know that that's the furthest thing from the case. Uh, yeah, a lot of people think that you know special forces are baby killers and all that garbage. I got a lot of that when I came back from the the navy and in the navy in here, and that's one of the reasons I went back in. Um, yeah, it's not you know special forces are teachers, and what people don't realize is they're teaching the the native country people you know that that are there. They're teaching them how to fight their own battles so that Americans don't have to go fight and. Um, I mean, I had 133 Vietnamese with me on my outpost, and uh, it was uh, Camp um, 554, CIDG camp, and uh, those are mountain yards there. 
the guy with the rifle actually fought in Dien Bien Phu. Oh, yeah, and this other guy down bottom was Hagara. Hager. Yeah, that's Hagara. And I can't remember the other guy's name, but he was he was a he was always a jokester. He was a cool guy. Well, it's and like he's kind of laughing. Carried, yeah, he, he was a jokester. They were cool. They carried our gear when on on the A team. Uh, they would carry uh, a lot of our equipment, you know, um, like our food, and they would sac- actually make our coffee for us. Uh, they're the ones, they're the culprits that got me hooked on coffee. <laughs> I mean, they'd make a cup of coffee and put five packs of coffee into it, you know, and, and they had the sucra, which is like a sugar cream, and they would put that in there, you know, half coffee, five packs, you know, and then half cream, and it was so good. I mean, this I'm glad I got up. I went down and had my cup of coffee with four shots in it. <laughs> I, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, there there was another. Uh, there's many of them, but one particular that told me a story when he was uh, at an A camp and they would go out on on night patrol. No, I'm I, I'm sorry, I, I mixed that up. It was a Mike Force man, uh, and he had a uh, a a Montagnard that was his bodyguard, uh, basically. And, um, every night they bed up, um, he would make the, the Americans bed first, and then he'd make sure everything was safe, then make his bed. And then he'd immediately after that was done, he'd get his coffee ready for the night. He'd cook his meal, the same meal for 56 straight days and he dare not let the young man know that he got tired of it or wasn't liking it because he was it was it would have killed him it was his uh, just his routine and how much he uh revered that man and he yeah. he would sit there uh let let the 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 captain eat and would stand guard while he was eating and until he got done and then he would eat and make sure the captain fell asleep they he'd light a cigarette for to go to sleep and would share it and would make sure the captain fell asleep safely before he fell asleep every night for 56 straight days. Wow. Yeah. We, we never, I never smoked in the field. I, I don't, I've never smoked in my life, but um, uh, we never let the guy smoke. Cause you can smell oh. that. Oh yeah. I mean, I got to the point where I could smell the enemy, you know, they, especially the sappers, they, they burn charcoal and put charcoal on their face. Mm-hmm. And if you ever smelt like when you put a fire out with water, you know, you get that smell. And that's what they smell like. Um, but I had a real keen sense of smell. I could I could pick up the enemy. Um, I could, um, if they were walking through the area, their smell would linger a little bit. Uh, I'd walk through and see grass. Grass would be laying down and you see the grass coming up slowly, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we I, tell, I saw a lot of that when I was on the A-team. And um, in CNC, when I ran missions over in Laos and stuff, the... Uh, We'd see footprints. Well, I remember one time we were walking. We walked in a circle, walked across our footprints, and we could see the enemy's tracks behind on them, <laughs> right behind us. So, wow. yeah. And then we then we went over and took a little R, not an R win, but just just to take a break. And we were sitting in the ground, and all of a sudden we heard this noise, and the enemy walked. They were like they were like three four feet away from me. I'm laying down on the ground, looking off to the side. I can see their legs walking by, and I'm going, whoa. <laughs> I thought they were going to hear my heart beating. <laughs> you know, oh like bang, bang, God. freeze. <laughs> oh, I, I I can't even imagine that. Oh, uh, yeah, some of y'all stories, even even hearing them uh, uh, th- through the through the phone or on here, I, I, I get goose pimples just, just thinking about it. God almighty. <laughs> um, One thing I'd like to say is, you know, I'm blinking a lot. I, my eye on this side here is just irritating the crap out of me. Um, I had three explosions on my right side and it, and that's why I got a lazy eye here and stuff. Um, and I just had a bunch of bone taken out up here from when I got hit in the face with that stuff. It, it caused the, uh, the periosteum on the bone to grow, grow new bone. I started getting like little horns up here. So I had them take that out. But, um, yeah, that, that's why I'm blinking a lot. Somebody if it, me. if it becomes an issue and, and we need oh, to, no. uh, let us know. We don't want to cause any cause no, any no. issues. It's, it's, no, it's not, nothing like that. It's just that I'm blinking a lot because of it. It's irritating. Um, yeah, I had a, an RPG go off on the side here, and I got hit with three pieces of shrapnel. Um, <sighs> then I had a 122 rocket. I was getting in a truck, and it landed on the other side of the truck. That kind of gave me a, you know, brain damage or whatever. But it finally, uh, 
you know, and then getting hit in the face that, and, uh, oh, and then I had a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a concussion, concussion grenade. We were doing a war game with the Navy SEALs and my buddy and I were running up a road and they started throwing these flashbangs or what do you want to call them? You know, these, uh, fake grenades and they threw it and it landed right down by my feet and it blew up and it, it my, I mean, I was bleeding from rocks and stuff hitting me in the face, but that, that did a number on me. I did the one that did me here was, um, I was doing teaching prisoner snatch and, uh, I was the prisoner. So they pretend like the guys are walking up the trail and I'm laying over by the trail. They blew the claymores and a concussion mm. grenade, and it about rolled me over and about my head just rattled. I swear that was the last time I ever did that. So, but uh, yeah, so I just kind of screwed myself up on that one. Uh, I, I, Galil, I'm about to get to your y'all, your y'all's questions, but is, would this be the 122 that messed you up? Um, yes, that is. That's from the 122 that messed me up. And that's yeah. right. That's up at Doc Toe. Now, I get look, there on I mean, flight like with RT Delaware. Look at the size of that thing. My oh, no, God. those things are 10 feet long. That thing there's only, you know, about, it's, it's probably like maybe two feet long there, maybe a little longer. But uh, they're 10 feet long, those rockets. Oh, my God. And you can hear them coming. I'd be sitting, I was getting ready to get into the truck to go pick up some guys that were swimming in the, in the Doc Toe River. And uh, I was getting in the truck, and all of a sudden I heard this... And I just yelled rockets and I just hit the deck and it landed right on the other side of the truck and just the truck lifted up and stuff, but it blew off in great big giant chunks and the truck didn't get damaged. Just the concussion moved it. Holy. So, somebody was watching out for me. <laughs> hey, you, yeah, that's for dang sure. My goodness. Wow. Uh, Khalil would like to know what was the, uh, uh, best piece of enemy intel you gained, docs, treasure, weapons that you and your team were most proud of collecting from the enemy? Um, you know, everything we collected, we turned over to the government. But, um, you know, um, I would say um, I picked up pith helmets. I picked up uh, oh, my one of my favorite pieces, and they gave it back to me, was a um, an officer's belt and uh enemy nva officer's belt and then i had uh, some vietnam medals too that i picked up and that was at the uh, cobra 4 when i went in on that bright light we ran a sweep through the village and we picked that stuff up um so those that's probably about it uh most of the weapons and stuff that i got uh i would take down to uh, cameron bay and trade it to the rare echelon guys and trade it to them and they would get me uh you know like i i made flags i made enemy flags and stuff and would trade it um one time i traded a flag for 36 cases of meat uh brought it back to the main camp and um then i trade i trade for weapons stuff for chain link fence for concrete um uh i had a mini gun and so i needed 24 volt batteries for that you know you can use two 12 volts but the hueys have 24 volt batteries so i was looking for one of those uh you know that kind of stuff and and the ammo you know, stuff like that. On my wow. outpost, I had a 50 caliber on my outpost. So, and we used to have fun shooting that. If wow. fact flew over, when I was on my outpost and the fact flew over, you know, um, they, I, they'd they ask if there's anything I, they can do for me. I'd say, well, go up and chase some animals down this way. So they'd go up and chase deer or pigs or something down towards the camp. And then we'd sit there and shoot in front of them with the 50 caliber and the rocks would go up and it would kill them. And then I'd send a team out. They'd grab and come back, and we'd have a big barbecue. Wow. Holy cow. Um, now, did you just say you had a minigun uh, that you yeah. needed batteries for? Was yeah, this it? Was it? A CCS. It was a minigun out of CCS. This is – I wonder I wonder if you knew Mr. Terry Soresby. Was it this minigun at, at CCC? Uh, no, it was the. It came from CCS, and I was at A502 at the time. No, it wasn't that one. No, okay. they, um, I don't know what. I've, they had one at CCS that was that was on the back end of a truck. I've and, got pictures, um, and I've got to find yeah. that photo. And you can um, only shoot forward and backwards. You can't shoot from the side. It would actually lift the truck up. Oh my goodness. Um. So, but I think Jim Roush brought it. I think he got it. And brought it to A502, and then I got, and then uh, we had this captain at A502 that got all over my case. He was a, he was an asshole, but he got all a guy named Crabtree, 
he went ahead and got on my case and said it's against the Geneva Convention and blah blah blah. And I, you know, he'll bite me, you know. I'm gonna find that because uh, I've actually got a photo of the uh, the minigun. I'll get a question while we're uh, while I'm grabbing that. Um, this is and that other funny. one. I, I mean, so many cultural beliefs. Redheads <laughs> have supernatural powers. Do you think <laughs> the military advantage? No, I think what it is is uh, I, I, you know, British people. If you ever watch the old movies, you know, it's like you know, hip hip, you know. <laughs> they're uh they're a little different on because you know I, I i'm not i don't take a lot of things serious you know i figure you're not going to get out of the world alive and unless unless you're on the space shuttle and it blows up on the way out so <laughs> which is tragic <laughs> I, I was also a paramedic for the space shuttle too but um the yeah, the um i i don't you know i was born in liverpool i'm irish um but you know the irish went over to liverpool and worked on the ships uh you know probably over 100 couple 150 years ago or so my grandfather worked as a on trains i believe it was in in liverpool my father was worked on ships um so that yeah but i think that's probably what it is it's just my british upbringing uh redheads uh my father was a redhead uh, a lot of my family are redheads you know on on my father's side but um yeah i think it's just the british in me that 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 uh, makes you do things that are a little bit more daring you know like they'll you you take more chances uh, i've always had a lot of uh, trust in my equipment you got to have trust in your equipment like diving or jumping or anything if you don't have trust in your equipment you're going to freak out so i have trust in my equipment i know i got a reserve and so if it doesn't open i just pull the reserve and just move on you know i don't think twice about it um I mean, I think the crossover between, you know, life and death is probably, probably scary. It'd probably be kind of freakish to me, but I'm not afraid. You know, I'm not afraid if it's my time, it's my time. I'm not worried about it. I'm a strong Christian. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm, uh, I'm my best not afraid. Uh, um, I, of course, I don't want to leave all my good friends, but we'll meet yeah, again exactly. in, on the next, next plane. Um, Galil has another, uh, a good one. What was, what the, was most the most sophisticated fit engineering that you came across in the jungle? Um, feet of engineering in the jungle, maybe some um, bridges or, uh, hooch. Yeah, off of well, you know, that's, that's a good point. You know, on the bridges, when I went back there in, um, 2002, you know, I went up the Ho Chi Minh trail. I hired a North Vietnamese guy that they were out there cutting trees down. I hired a guy in a, a Jeep to take me up in the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I stopped at some of these bridges. Those bridges that were that were built on the Ho Chi Minh Trail were uh they were amazing. The the workmanship on those bridges were really amazing. Um I've got pictures, but they're on slides and um uh, in fact I think I even have movies of them. Uh but I I I I'll probably put that together in a in a book. But they're they're all on film. I I don't have pictures of them exactly, but um, yeah, the the bridges were amazing. And then afterwards, they started putting the bridges underwater, so that you know the water would go over the bridge and they could drive across it. And if you're flying overhead, you can't see it because of the reflection. They they would they would take and put bamboo around over the roads so you couldn't see the roads. You know they tie the trees together and everything. Uh, the enemy village it was actually a hospital when I went on Code Grade Four. That whole village uh, was uh, covered over with woven bamboo over the top of it, so you couldn't see it from above. Um, that you know, so yeah, those are probably some of the biggest feats. Uh, on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they had a lot of spots where they they had refueling stations, and um, they had those. And then about every, I guess, fifty miles or forty miles, depending on the road. They had these that uh, they called band trunks and they they had places there where the people could stay their engineering on that road was uh was really amazing they had bulldozers that once the b-52 came through and blew up the road they'd go in there and, and clean it back up again on the bridges if the bridge got you know they had a road that they'd put around it during um like uh monsoons they'd use the bridge and then during the months when it was dry they they drive around the bridge you know, uh, I saw a lot of that. So, yeah, that's about the the biggest engineering feats that I saw. The enemy was pretty smart. I mean, they they were 
they were good fighters. You know, they were they were good people when it came oh, to yeah. story. Um, just their sheer de de determination on the trail when y'all would find something, blow it to hell, and and they'd have it yeah. rebuilt that night. You know, I mean, they, yeah. you've got to respect that determination, no matter how you feel about them. And one of the things that we did is we bombed that trail every third night. So they knew when it was going to be bombed and they just stayed away from it. And, um, you know, during in between, I mean, I, I remember going up to the, up to the road, you go up to the Hoachman trail there and you, you, the trucks that go by, we'd try to see what's inside the trucks. You try to do it when there's a full moon or something. So you can see, and, uh, you would have try to see if there's, you know, if it's food supplies, weapons, enemy, you know, troops, you try to see all that. Uh, so it was kind of amazing that way. Absolutely. Uh, I found a photo of Bob the Baron Bechtold on the CCS gun truck. Yeah. There yeah, it that's is. Three quarter, I think. Yeah. Yes, sir. And that looks like a, the one I had. And uh, there's a, I, there, there, I recently just found a picture that said uh, the beast of debt, uh, uh, A502, and it looks like y'all had a French armored car with a minigun on it. Uh, on A502? To... Unless yeah. somebody took it and put it on there after I left. No, no, they didn't, because I was there when the team closed. No, I don't know. Let's, let's see this before we get to the questions, because if this is while you were there, this could be interesting. Hmm. I don't think that's a minigun, is it? Hiding under its most hiding its most potent weapon concealed under the brown flap, a six barrel minigun. Okay, so I guess, yeah, I guess maybe it is a minigun. I don't, I I don't remember seeing that vehicle there. That's pretty wild. There's the uh, Det A five hundred two uh, little team house sign, the entrance. But uh, yeah. that's uh, and guys, this is a great. Uh, a great website I'll share with y'all. It's like I said, the history of A502, the uh, milkshakes, the famous uh, ice milk cream shake. place. Uh, yeah, they died. Uh, no, we didn't have an ice cream place at A502. Oh, I mean, uh, the the HQ, it's showing the uh, fifth group oh. headquarters in the train oh, okay. and uh, the uh, the famous Dairy Queen that they had there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mike was curious. Um, actually, let me, uh, Dan, let me make sure with you because I answered, but I, I could be wrong. Daniel was wondering about Rakondo no. School. No, it was, um, I think, let me see, the oceans there. Is a, it was just north of, on the north side of the Triangle. Fifth Group was pretty much like down by across from the airport. It was, there was a road that went around the uh, periphery of, of the Trang. Uh, they were, they were, Probably, uh, I would say maybe a mile or maybe two miles apart. Yeah, the Ricondo School was right next to the cock course, the combat orientation course. If you got on the road, we we're on one side of the road, they were on the other side of the road. And uh, in fact, they used to run, I think, around the airport or run up around headquarters or something every day for exercise. So but they had the. They, they, the were, they, were, they were separated. It so wasn't, they had the. The new guys coming into the COC course, and then they'd have some of the old hats or some of the not FNGs, but guys going into Rakondo school there in the same Natrang area, kind of. Yeah, not everybody in Rakondo school was special forces. Uh, quite a few of them were like uh, long range recon, you know, the LERPs. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. A lot of those guys were coming in. I think Gary, Gary Stuckey, I think, went through that school. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Gary, uh, later, uh, served with you at CCC with RT Arkansas. Uh, very yeah, accomplished. He, uh, him and I were at a five two together. And then we, we were probably, but him and I served the close, the, the longest together in Vietnam. Um, but, uh, we went, he asked me where I was going to go when the turn team turned over to regional Papa forces. And I said, I'm going to go up to CNC and he goes, well, I might as well go with you. So then Gary and I both, they sent us up to CCC. He went to Arkansas and I went to Delaware. That's so and cool. We, we talked quite a bit. We're, I was we, about to say, did y'all get to at least keep in touch and chit chat oh, yeah. while y'all? That's great. Because I hear some guys. Last, he was going to be at the last sore, but he, he got COVID and he couldn't had to cancel everything. <laughs> I, I, I was wanting to make sure because some of the guys that went in with friends and they said uh, the, the way the team was set up or what have you uh, or how busy they were, they didn't get to spend much time. And I thought that was a shame that there they went through all the training together and were their first tour together. And then they got, were on the same base and 
you know, didn't get to see each other much. No, Gary and I would bump into each other probably at least once a week or so up at CNC. I remember when That's I was down at Long Ton, um, I went back up. We had a guy. I wanted to go back up to the main camp because one of my team members was getting married. And, um, man, they got me so snockered. Um, I went out to their, their little village, and um, there was these three, 13 girls sitting there on this table. Oh. And um, they wanted to have a glass of wine, you know, the rice wine with me. So I drank a can of rice wine and I'm leaving and my interpreter goes, um, he goes, where are you going? I go, well, I said, uh, I said, I already had a can of white rice wine. He says, you only drank to one of them. There's 13 of them. I ended up having 13 cans of rice wine and I got so in their Coca-Cola cans. I got so snockered. I remember the record player was skipping. So I climbed up a ladder to change the record, put it back to play the music again, cranked it up because there was a crank up. All of a sudden, the ladder starts going back. I hit the ground. I rolled through the fire pit, landed on the other side, and they just picked me up. And they, we, we were. I borrowed a, a deuce and a half because when the guy was getting married, uh, he had to move all his girlfriend's stuff over to his place or whatever we were doing. They were doing. So I borrowed a truck, a deuce and a half, and um, that's a two and a half ton. And uh, we, we were supposed to have it back like in about two hours, you know. So it was probably like 10 o'clock at night. We're driving up and they're all, all the guys are in the back of the truck yelling. And they had the, the, the Constantina wire across the road already. And the Vietnamese that were guards, you know, the Vietnamese don't like Montagnards that well. So they were giving them a hard time. Finally, they told me, said, well, look in the truck. And they saw me laying in there and I'm all like drunker than a skunk laying there, passed out. And so then they, they finally opened the gate and let us in. We took the truck back. They carried me over to the Montagnard Club, laid me out on some chairs, and every time they took a drink, they'd pour a drink down my throat. And uh, I woke up about two days later in the on the other side of the berm, into the berm around the, the camp. I'm laying out there, and I'm, I'm laying there for two days. And finally, I wake up, and I go over, and, and I go over to where Gary's place, where Gary, Gary's uh, hooch was. He wasn't there. I guess they were on a mission out in the field, so I kicked the door in. I climbed in his bed. And when he got there, there was vomit all over the floor, all over everything. I was so sick. And so him and another guy grabbed me and they drug me to the shower, washed me off, cleaned me up, dragged me over to the mess hall, fed me, got me oh, back. Guys. And then I felt like I was dying. I was. And then one of my buddies told me, he said, he says, well, we saw you in the club. You look like you're having such a good time. I go, uh, I could have died, man. <laughs> Oh, well, you're having such a good time. <laughs> what, what, what good guys, though? I mean, man, not, not many guys would, uh, A, especially with you making such a mess on your way into rest, you know, get you out, clean you up, take care of you, and feed you like that. That's uh, that yep. Mr. Gary was a, is a is a good man. That's, uh, that, that's top-notch yeah, friendship right there. Yeah, he's um, a real good guy. When we go to the <laughs> store together and we go to the special ops reunion, we always, um, we always share the room together. Wow. Uh, yeah, he's a good guy. I like Gary. Good man. And this is a photo. I want to bring this up because uh, the viewers have heard uh, of a lot about Moose Monroe from Tony Love, who is oh, at CCS, yeah. who's been, uh, who will be coming on. And uh, he actually just private messaged me to, to link up. But there is uh, Mr. Jim and Mr. Alton Moose, Moose Monroe. Monroe right there. What's Moose's real name? It's um, Alton. 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 Yes, Moose was it was a very smart man when it came to tactics. I learned a lot from Moose. I learned a lot of tactics from him, and that's Lorelai in the middle. A cute oh, okay. Little yeah. yeah, very. Where where did you first cross paths with Moose? Because he was uh, in the one projects and, and no one zero school. Oh, at one zero was he teaching? Yeah, he was one of the instructors. And then um, wow. when I went back there, when I left and came back to the states. I, I sent Moose a, a pair of bib overalls and St. Laurent. I sent St. Saint, uh, Saint a, uh, a box of um, Tony hair perm because, you know, uh, um, St. Laurent had really curly kind of a reddish hair, kind of an auburn looking hair. He had real, a lot of curls. And so I sent him the home, the Tony perm. <laughs> wow. That's great. <laughs> Moose, wow, is I... a, Moose is a good guy. I like Moose. He, uh, we, Saint, Saint passed away. 
we, uh, it's very we uh, we've heard a lot from Mr. Uh, Tony about him, and then I've uh, also heard from other CCC men that I didn't uh, know uh, had any contact with him. And come to find out, one of the men I speak with was in Ranger School pre Vietnam with him. So very mm-hmm. interesting, and he, uh, like you said, uh, was very good in the woods. Very good. Yeah, he was a smart cookie. I learned a lot. Um, it is men like these that have blazed a path into battle for future generations to follow. Yeah, I think maybe. I don't know. E- absolutely. Absolutely. Eric, give me a big head. Come on, Eric. You're going to give me a big head. <laughs> uh, Galil was curious about modern rifles. Uh, would, would, would you replace your car 15 of the day with anything modern if you had to change no, the that car 15 was a nice, uh, that's a really nice weapon. A lot of the guys use it, use it today. A mm-hmm. lot of the guys are using it today. Um, you know, this uh, little, little gun that you see everybody, diff, you know, all the companies are making the same. They all look alike. Yeah. That's, that's all taken from the car 15. Israel's still using a ton of, uh, I think uh, they may not be SOG years, but they're right after. They're they're still using American car 15s a lot. I love seeing videos in Israel of guys using the, the car 15s with uh, not super Gucci setups with maybe a handguard like y'all would put on or and stuff like that. It's just... Yeah. Well, the car, I think car 15 has a little bit of knockdown power and stuff. You know, the, the you know, the Israeli Uzi, the Uzis are, they're okay, but uh, they don't have as much knockdown, knockdown power, that nine millimeter. And um, I mean, I carried an Uzi, I carried an Uzi with a silencer on it. I carried it without the silencer. I I carried a Swedish K one time and they, they fire from the open bolt. I had a Sten gun that I, you know, I had a silencer on the Sten gun. That was, that was a really nice weapon. That thing was so quiet. I mean, you, you'll be pulling it. It goes, that's all you hear, you know? And it's like, is this thing working? <laughs> you know? So, but uh, yeah. But um, yeah, that car 15 is probably about the best one to go out in the woods with, you know, in the wow. jungle. Uh, Galil had a, 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 well, two questions. We'll save that one for the end because he's asking about your passion project of meteors. We'll get into in a bit. But um, yes. what was your rarest small arm weapon uh, that you encountered in the jungle? On I guess that on I encountered your... in the jungle, or I, I, I carried um, a nine millimeter once while I carried the twenty two high standard. It had a silencer on it. Um, but in the jungle, I took a, I got a, a Tokarov T33, T33, I think it's called. It's a, a pistol. I had a matching, the matching holster, the gun, and the magazines all matched. I got that from an officer uh, in an ambush. Uh, I got that, and I got an enemy flag. The enemy flag, I had the whole team sign it, and that flag is in a in a museum right now. But um, uh, and it has Lou Merletti's signature on there too. Um, yeah, that's it right there. And there's Lou Merletti's signature. I'm on there too somewhere. I don't know where I signed it. Yeah, there's Beamit's on there. Uh, no, that's Merletti. I don't know where I signed it. I, I signed it someplace on there. Gary, um, John uh, Gerhardt, he's a, um, he's a forest ranger now. Um, this guy down here, the rifleman, he wasn't special forces. He was like a long range recon or something. And he was there and there's just Sonny Hoffman, um, Bob Holly, Bob Holly still with us. He's up in, um, uh, there's Sonny Hilliard. Hilliard uh, was an interesting guy. Hilliard, um, he was on a rock one time and he was facing the, the hill. We, we were, we had a battle going on in the hill and, they told him to get on the horn, the, you know, so he got on the horn, he turned sideways and the bullet went in one peck out, out the other side of the peck into the other peck and out the other side of the peck. He had a cool looking scar. It looked like the man called horse, you know, like in your hand, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, Holy cow. Did he have any, I mean, was he okay? I mean, yeah, any he life? Fine. Yeah, he was wow. fine. Bullet, it was a clean, clean shot. I mean, the bullet, it didn't like blow out his chest or anything it's just uh just the muscle he had like four little holes holy cow wow um so, yeah, that's about it the, um most of the weapons you know the the older guys would carry sks's but most of the guys carried ak's that pistol find uh people would uh give you an arm and a leg today for that thing 
that took her off. That that uh wow. you know, when, I, when I was in Vietnam, I saved most of my money. So when I came back, I wanted to get my private pilot's license. I was flying before, but I, I did I didn't have um I didn't get any license. I left right away, so I didn't get a chance to get a license. So when I came back in 71, I went and spent five thousand to get my, my license for flying. And um but on that pistol, you know, since I wasn't getting much money each payday. So what I did is I, I sold it so I'd have enough money to go downtown and get laid and stuff. <laughs> get <laughs> that smart, <laughs> smart man, smart man. Gosh, we've got some great well, I'm not questions. a gun person anymore. I mean, I've got a few pistols and stuff, but, you know, I don't, uh, I carry concealed. You know, I got concealed carries and stuff, but I don't, um, I'm not big in the weapons. Not at all. Not like a lot of the guys in SF. I mean, I got so much time behind a weapon. It's like, come on, man, this is boring. I've uh, oh, I've got I've I've got the bird hunting shotgun, uh, and well, of course, I got slugs and all that for home defense. A nine millimeter, and then I do have a, a AAR, but I'm not dressing it up. I'm not trying to look like an operator or a Delta guy or anything yeah, like that. No. I just keep I it in state. Steel. Keep Nobody it proficient, no sights. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep it up, keep as less attention on myself as I can. Yeah, and at um, thirty at thirty paces, I could probably put three rounds into a fifty cent piece. I've had the gun for years, probably over almost thirty years. I've had a Walther PPKS. That that is my all time favorite gun. Uh, yeah, my, that and the Browning High Power. I, I, those two guns. I I, I if I could get one and I would die happy man. <laughs> well, mine was getting old. I had a Browning high powers. It was getting old. And so I, uh, I, I, I traded it and added some money and I got a SIG. So oh, a how, do like, how, how do you like, how do you like the SIGs? You do? I like SIGs. I, I couldn't even tell you what, which one it is right now, but I like the SIG six hour pistols. I don't like Glock at all. Um, but you know, like a lot of people say, well, the police department uses Glocks. I said, well, the police department, only 10% of the cops will ever draw their pistol out and only 1% will ever fire it. So, yeah, they get a good deal with Glocks. So, you know, a lot of police departments have them. But uh, I've had Glocks uh, jam on me. I know the new Glocks are very good. They're, they're good pistols. But the old ones, I shoot like this with my hand, you know, like like, like this. And and if your hands on that magazine, it'll it'll double feed on you. And I had a real problem with it, so I I hated Glocks ever since. I got a brand new uh, last year a new nine. Sorry guys, I'll get back to y'all's question. I went off on a tangent. I got a new uh, nine by nineteen, and I I love it. I've yet to have any uh, issues. I'm I'm the same way. I got a new. Uh, the one thing I did j go out for customization, I did get a new magazine with a uh uh. Uh, pink, uh, pinky uh, grip to where I can wrap my finger around the mag uh, at the bottom of the oh, mag. Yeah. Uh, that's mm -hmm. about all I've done, and it's been a absolutely wonderful weapon. I, I, I love. I can see how people don't like Glocks, but I've, I'm very partial to them. I love them. See, I'm um, old fashioned. I like Colt Smith and Wesson. Those, you know. I would like. I'm. I'm gonna try and get myself a, a 1911, and if I can ever save up money for that and a Browning, that those are my two go-to uh, desert island pistols to say have forever. Um, I, I want. I'm looking for a 308 with a scope, a real nice one. A uh, we. I got a buddy that'll build one for me. My uh, gosh, who was it? Uh, my buddy from college uh, had just got a. 308 with a new Leupold scope, and I forgot if it was a Winchester, a Savage, or a Remington, but uh, he's already gotten a, a nice size deer this year. But uh, this is a great question because you were actually served with a uh, pretty hardcore uh, older vet. I think he was Korean War. Uh, how are the relations between you younger guys and the Korean War era vets in the SOG organization? Well, there wasn't that many. Uh, mm -hmm. like that. But uh, my one one was uh, Homer Hungerford. And Homer served in the Second World War and Korean War. And a lot of guys who want to run with him because he was an older guy. But um, I looked at him and like, uh, my gosh, this guy's got a ton of knowledge. You know, if you're going to get into a battle, this guy's not going to cower or anything like that. So uh, yeah, I, I loved Homer, man. He was a great guy. 
um, he was with me on the Cobra 8 4 mission, and uh, he passed away in 2014. But uh, what a great guy. He was like your um, uh, Mark, not Mark, Tw um, not Mark Twain. What's the other? Um, oh, the guy that drank rum and everything in Cuba. What's his name? Oh, gosh. Why are we mixing this up? Uh, Don or Hemingway. Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway. Mm -hmm. He was like Hemingway. When wow. uh, Homer took 30 days leave, he went to Africa and did some big game hunting. You know, and uh, never drank a touch of alcohol when he was in uh, in Vietnam. And uh, I remember when he came back to the States, we got together in San Francisco. We we're at the top of the mark. And I the door was open. He says, come on in. I walk in and he's naked on the bed. And he's got this French masseuse gal, beautiful gal, giving a massage. And then we took off and went to Sausalito. And he knew a guy up there named uh, Lyons. Lyons was one of the, the cameramen for... Um, uh, Hatari with John Wayne oh. and he had a big movie theater in his house so we we had dinner with them him and his wife and stuff and his kid and then we went over to um I can't remember Lyon's first name but we went over to his house there in Sausalito and had a great time um but Homer was really quite a guy really just a, a wonderful man just a good guy great great stories you know he's in a he was in a book where one gal wrote a book and they 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 were having sex on the church steps of a Catholic church on the steps. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I got your beat, man. I says, I, I had a girl on a bar stool once. <laughs> wow, that is wild. hilarious. <laughs> That's great. I, I, I mean, I had a pretty wild life before I got married. I was about to say, I mean, how could y'all not? I mean, I, I look back on y'all's photo that and thank God, Jason Hardy, if y'all, uh, when he watches or if y'all don't have Jason's books, uh, this is one of the editions, uh, gems and gems and two of them. Um, y'all got to get them because it not only shows great action photos of the guys in the field, but it shows them having fun at, at the base. And it's almost, it's a fraternity. It really is. I mean, it's a fraternity mm -hmm. built in blood and, and, and bonds, but it's a fraternity nonetheless. And yeah, we're all yeah, it had to be the time of y'all's lives. Yeah, it, it is. Tilt's coming out with a book. Uh, it'll probably be out by the end of the year, you know, uh, next year. Heard um, you're going to be featured prominently in that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, he's probably the first or second chapter or something like that. I know he just, I just gave him a bunch of pictures and they're going to be doing stuff with that. So, and I got to get my books done. You know, I've, I've been worried. That's what this big mess is sitting right here. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to have some parties in my house for like the coffee shop where I hang out. And then a bunch of my buddies from when I was, you know, when I used to live on the airstrip, they're all going to come down and a couple of the business people in town. So I'm going to have a couple of parties. So I took everything, all the tools out of my living room and, and put them right here. So. <laughs> Well, I, that was actually. I'm glad you mentioned that because guys had, had, were asking if uh, you, you, if if you're working on a book, and if not, you desperately need to think about it because they are wanting to uh, to read a, a wild carrot book. Um, yeah, I'm gonna probably do about five books. Oh wow, that is a great great news for today. I'll, that is outstanding. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, do great one question. On days, wow. One on uh, my military career. One on. Uh, Cobra 8 4 and then two two children's books. Oh, wow. So we'll be getting at least two full on uh, yeah. I get, then. I've got the whole system set up downstairs where I, I can do it. And um, but I, I'm trying to get my house finished. That's what all the tools are. Uh, you know, I've been working on my house for my house is built in 1912. So I've been I added put an addition on the house and um, yeah, so it's I've got to, I'm, I'm I got to finish up the downstairs, and then when I get the house sold, uh, I'll probably move down to the airstrip here. I was thinking I'm buying another airplane, or I might just go ahead and open up a business in town here. You know, a candle, chocolate, um, uh, some bookshop or something. I'll do something, or maybe an ice cream parlor or something. But I'd like to do something, you know, in town here. Bisbee, where I live in Bisbee, Arizona, is a really a cool little town. Uh, if you ever get in Arizona, you want to come, I live right on the Mexican border and it's, it's, we have no problems whatsoever with the people coming across. Um, we don't have them coming across. We have a lot of people coming from Naco and they come up 
and uh, Douglas, you know, our Prieta, they'll come up here and they, they just get a bite to eat, do some shopping and go back home again. Um, but they come up all the time. We have mariachis come up and play music on the weekends sometimes. Uh, it, it's just a fun town. It's a, it's a, it's an awesome town and the people, it's a very liberal town. Uh, they know I'm a conservative. So, but we all get along great. Nobody, nobody talks pop. Like I was in a, I was, you know, the coffee shop has music every, every Sunday and everybody brings their dogs in. Everybody's got dogs here. They walk around, they brought the dogs in and the dogs were barking at each other. And one of the guys goes, Hey, no politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, but that's just the way it is here in Bisbee. It's just everybody, they give you hugs every place you go. It's just a wonderful town. I've, I've heard uh good things. I think one of the, uh, one of the big podcasters, maybe uh, uh, Mike Glover, may have an office out there in uh, uh, his no, not, his company. No, he's in Utah, and I think uh, oh, okay. I think he just bought property up in Montana or something like that. Okay, I didn't know if he was. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I want Mike Glover, Glover to to interview me. Him I'll, and, I, him and I uh, got, Ryan, uh, Sean with, uh, Ryan, uh, guys, y'all. Uh, Y'all heard him. Y'all let's we'll start flooding both of their Instagrams and Twitters and get him uh, on there because that they, yeah. they keep saying and they keep saying every time I've heard them say it. And I've reached out to numerous guys online uh, and y'all need to start helping me of flooding people saying I can get you hooked up with men that you need to talk to. So y'all heard it. Let's start uh, a little and campaign Jack here and, and get uh, either Jack, Sean, all of them, Jack, Sean, yeah. Mike. Uh, heck, Jocko needs to have you on. That would be well. I, I'm, I'm on Jocko with a, you know, um, tilt. Did Sog? Sog we Pond. need a. We need yeah. just you and Jocko though. You, you need a full two and a half hours or so with Jocko. That, that's what you need too. Uh, so okay. guys, let's start doing that. I'm. I've been doing it a while. Let let let's start that yeah, up. Not, not very many guys that served in the Navy in Vietnam, you know, and shore duty, and then did special forces, and then Max Sog, you know, tier one guys, and then going into the Air Force as a pararescue man. There's not very many. N not n not at all. I I'd, I'd, I'd be willing to bet it, it, you could count it on one hand, maybe just a few. Uh, I, that. <laughs> well, a lot of guys that did three branches. Um, but uh, a lot of them like reserves and then went active. Uh, I, I was going to go into the Navy SEALs when I was in the Navy because I, you know, I hung around a lot of the guys at UDT and they're in Da Nang. Um, when we drop something in the water, like and I worked with cranes, we'd, they'd drop a bomb in the water, UDT would come over, dive down and get it hooked up. But they did a lot of their own missions too. You know, I'd, I'd go and get a bite to eat or something like that. And um, they'd be... Um, you see them coming in with their arms and braces where they got shot in the shoulder and you see that everyone, but I was going to go be a Navy SEAL until that song came out only three out of a hundred make the beret. And I'm going to ah, bull pucky. I can do that. I was a gymnast in high school, so I was in really good shape. So that's amazing. How many song, uh, how many people heard or read the, exactly. the book green berets and, and that changed their whole trajectory in life. I, I love that hearing, hearing you guys talk about that. Um, Kyle's got a great question. Um, in your personal opinion, what is the most crucial quality for a SOG recon man to possess? Uh, being cool, calm, collective, you know, and uh, knowing how to call an aircraft and how to operate when you're getting into a firefight. Uh, that, that's one of the most crucial things. If you uh, if you ever read the story with um, Lynn Black, uh, when they had a guy that was not qualified to be a team leader and they made him a team leader, he walks out on the trail. He got killed instantly and the guy behind him just fell to the ground crying his eyes out you know and praying uh because he was terrified so you have to have somebody that really knows what they're doing and don't you don't take chances like that you know you, you don't walk on trails you but uh lynn tried to tell him and they wouldn't listen and boom as soon as he walked on the trail he took like three steps and boom he was dead so th those are the most crucial things in sog a good sog operator knows how what to do and you have to have respect for the enemy but you got to know how to deal with them as well that's that's very crucial there's there's no other way around it and uh, another thing that, that you uh gosh you, you we've got some great questions and uh we'll we'll just do those to to end the show with um I, another thing is you know everyone uh new to to, to learning about sog and learning about y'all think it's 
all y'all and it's you've got to be the Rambo guy. You you don't have to worry about anything because you know everything. And you you've got to be good with mountain yards. You're you're indigenous. You've got to have uh like you it's almost like you said with being cool. You 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 need to be able to learn, take criticism, or else you're not gonna last long. You're you're gonna think you know everything and, and get off the, the 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 bird one day and 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 die. Well, you know, the, the crucial thing going on missions is going in and coming out of the mission. That's the most crucial time. That's that's the scariest time in a mission. Um, getting firefights really never bothered me too much, but I haven't been in some really heavy ones like 10,000 enemy. I've been in a couple of them are 350 enemy. But, uh, you know, and I had in one time I had uh, three guys and myself and the other one was just the three of us. Um, you know, because the chopper will come in, take half the team out, and then they come after you after that because you're you're a small team. And um, but uh, yeah, um, I, I lost my concentration there. Um, what were we talking about? Uh, good, well, you had answered. It was uh, what what were good qualities for a SOG man? Um, yeah. So you you that those are the most crucial things is really knowing how to handle a team and do it. And, you know, like I said before, going in, you, you sit there and you look at your guys because when guys are going in, they're they're just kind of laid back and they're 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 thinking. There's a lot going through their head. And then when you like, I had uh, I had one mission where they want I strap hanged on another team. It was with Hill Hill and his team. I don't even I can't remember what the team was, but we flew in. They they wanted us to go in and knock out a tank, and we're flying in. We're coming in, and we're getting shot out out of the primary i mean the bullets are just hitting the chopper left and right bullets were whizzing by us through the helicopter nobody got hit and then they pull back up they said put us in the secondary you go to the secondary the bullets are hitting the chopper i mean you can hear them just king 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 hitting the chopper and and uh and none of us got hit and so they pull up out of that one and the team leader just got up between the, the chairs and the chopper and just said hey put us down over there we get over there and we're coming down all of a sudden Tink, 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 tink. And all of a sudden I hear I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I'm reaching across trying to hold on to him, keep him from, because of the centrifugal force, trying to keep him from going out of the chopper. And uh, he caught a bullet in the foot. And uh, that ended that mission. But um, you have to be calm. I mean, going in like that, when you're going in, you're, you're just waiting. And you can hear the bullets. You don't think about it. The bullets are going around. They're hitting the chopper. But you're not thinking about that. You're thinking about, let's get off this thing. Before it falls out of the sky, you know, and uh, but I'm glad that mission ended because if we were on the ground. We would have had over a thousand people on a CZ. There were, and it was all slash and burn. There was no way you could you could get away from it. What they should have done is put us off someplace else, and we just walk a mile or so in. But um, that that just didn't happen. We we weren't expecting all that. Um, I can touch the Cobra Eight Four real quick. Um, oh, absolutely! Yes, yeah. please. Cobra, that that mission was um, uh, Cobra Eight Four. It was a, it was a uh, F four jet that went down. It was Air Force. It crashed. It was dropping a bomb on a bridge. The bombs were long, and he came in, hit a, hit the first hill, uh, bounced off his engines, left the aircraft, hit the second hill, and landed on the third hill. And we went in. We went in uh, on a short ladder, got down the ground. I waited for the next chopper to come in with Homer on it. And then we started walking down down the hill. It was all burned out from where the jet went through. So we walked down, and um, we got down there. And I looked, I looked off from my right. I saw three enemy, and uh, they could they would have shot. I think they were just there to let the their superiors know if anybody was coming in. But uh, one guy had a rifle on me. The other two guys, I couldn't tell they were behind a bush. And uh, I told my guys, "Kom song, kom song," you know, like don't shoot. And um, and because they're they're mountain yards, but they they know what that means. And so I just waved them out with a rifle, and they left. And so we started going down a little bit further. We started finding bunkers. Um, I found a graveyard with a communist star over it, and then I found a meeting hall with a twenty by twenty four foot building on it. And um, we went through to try to get the names off the graves, but I couldn't really read them. It looked like somebody wrote on with a pencil or something. And so then I was walking up the hill. We found. Um, I found a boot with a foot in it. Turned out to be an American boot. It was a jungle boot, and it had an indigenous foot, in, indigenous foot in it. We got up to the top of the hill, and as we're coming up, the they were shooting mini guns down. I could hear, I could hear traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and uh, 
all of a sudden they just unloaded with all their miniguns and they're firing down and just right over my head. I swear the bullets were only like about five feet over my head. Uh, and, and all the branches and sticks are falling down on me. And so I get on the horn. I go, what's going on? He goes, you got six truckloads of enemy and two armored cars coming after you and a bunch of troops behind them. And so uh, they estimated around 350 enemy just right there in the front. And so we got up the hill, got up on the top. The top of the hill was wiped out. I could see the uh, the squares on the ground where they had hooches. And um, there was a bomb laying there, like a 750-pound bomb. And a lot of those places will have bombs where they, they don't go off and they try to dissect the bomb, get the composition B out of it. And they use it for satchel charges and stuff. Uh, so um, anyway, we were there. And then... Uh, they said, we got to get you out of there. We're, and uh, we're running out of ammo. We're running, you know, the weather's coming in and uh, we're running out of fuel. So <clears throat> I got up to the second hill and I could see the jet on the third hill, uh, but it was really steep, really steep. I, it probably would have taken me at least another hour, hour to get over there. But anyway, they, they said, I told Homer, run through the village this way. I'll run through this way. And we got all the information we could all, you know, like pith helmets. And that's where I got that officer's belt. and. Uh, We've got a bunch of bandages and and um, medicinal stuff. We brought that back because they can evaluate that and know who it is that actually has all that. Uh, they can follow like if they found it up here and then they find it down here and they find it over there, then they know it's the same group moving down. So <clears throat> that that kind of comes in handy. And uh, so anyway, they came in and got the first, you know, Homer and a couple a uh, couple of guys out. And then there was just the three of us and myself on the ground. And then all of a sudden the enemy started coming through the bushes and we're fighting, trying to keep them down. And they got an RPG off it hit next to me and I got hit in the arm and in the chest and I still got shrapnel on my wrist. Um, so that, um, so we, we kept them down. We were knocking them down left and right. And then all of a sudden the, the chopper comes in. And I said, I want, I want gun Cobra gunships on both sides of that chopper coming in with them. And I want you to shoot down in these, these trees as best you can. And so the gunner was shooting like crazy, trying to keep the bad guys down. And they got the Cobra shooting down in there. And uh, the uh, the chopper, when he was coming in, we were running to get on the chopper. And we're shooting, you know, on the la from the ladders. And he's pulling up. And um, as he's just, as soon as we got on the ladders, I hear this boom like that. And what happened is the, the gunner wasn't watching and the, the chopper hit a tree. He knocked like two feet of his rotor off both ends of that rotor. And... Um, or, you know, each end of each rotor. And uh, he started pulling up. He was wobbling and, you know, everything and shaking. But he got up out of there and um, we got out of there and uh, none of us were seriously wounded or anything. But we couldn't get we couldn't get to the jet. And that always bothered me. So that in 2001, I ran into Harlow Short. Was, um, he, I, we met each other on Facebook. We started talking. He was on an A-team with me. He was one of our medics. And he says, well, why don't we just go back and do it? So um, I gave him like uh, $15,000 and he took off and went over and he started setting things up for me. And then I got work because I'm a doctor. I'm a radiologist, uh, retired now. But um, so I got I got the uh, I got I got about, I don't know, 20,000. And um, I took off. I took three months off and I took off and I went over and met him in Phnom Penh. And we talked with the uh, recovery teams while we were there. They said they didn't really have enough information to go back in. So one of the guys was a special forces guy. And he said, look, if you want to go, just go. And I said, uh, how do we do this? And he goes, well, go up the Ban Lung and just put it together and take off. So I flew up the Ban Lung um, and I put it together. Uh, Harlow was you know, not in good enough shape to go with us. But his son was uh, like, you know, 21 years old. So his son went with us. And he was like an interpreter. He, uh, Thai, I guess Thai and Laotian is pretty similar. So he could speak to him. And so anyway, we, we, uh, we took off, went to Ban Lung, and, and that was in 2001. And so we, I, I put, a get, put together a team, and luckily I, I hired um, the uh, province chief's son. And so we took, it took us 10 days walking through the jungle. We, we started off. Uh, with trucks going up to Tavang, and then we took elephant for a while. And then from there, we went to a little place and got a boat, you know, dugouts, and we went up the river in dugouts. And um, <clears throat> then we got to an area where there was a village next to the river. So we got off there and we spent the night there. 
And then it took us 10 days, but we hiked through the jungles, around the hills, over the mountains and everything up rivers. Uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia. And um, so we, we hiked up there, got up in there, and we spent uh, three days there. And on the third day, we got hung up, we got hit by um, uh, bandits. And so the bandits, they came out with, on, with guns on us. And uh, what saved my butt was that the province chief's son, and uh, they didn't want to deal with it because, you know, if they figure if anything happened to him, the, the chief's going to have everybody in the world coming after them and taking him out. So they, they have, some of them were up in Laos, came down, they met up with the guys in Cambodia, and they, um, uh, uh, they, were, they turned in the bandits because the governments aren't paying them. You know, they pay maybe every three months. <clears throat> so, so anyway, the, uh, we got up in there, we ran through. I didn't find anything. I brought pieces of the jet back. I uh, gave it to the family because I'm in touch with the family. And um, took us 10 days to get back. I threw a big party for the guys and um, had good food and stuff. And I paid them, uh, you know, well. And um, uh, from there, I, I went up to Laos and up into this took place in Cambodia, if I didn't say that. But then we went up to Laos, uh, went up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that's when I hired a North Vietnamese uh, company that was cutting down the trees up there. And they're doing a geno genocide up there. They're wiping out a lot of the uh, the uh, Hmong tribes that are living in the in the jungles up there, um, because the the government, the Laotian government, doesn't want them in the cities because they're not educated in, in city life or whatever, and they don't have any place to keep them, and um, they don't want them in the jungles either because the government's making money on the North Vietnamese cutting down all that hardwood trees up there, and it's really sad because they're they're making it very difficult for the wildlife up there too. So um, anyway, from uh, from there, I went up there and I ran up to. I got pictures of tanks and uh, aircraft that were crashed up there in uh, 37 millimeters. I got a Sam met. I uh, got up. I got pictures on a Sam missile up there, um, up outside of Atapu, Laos. I ran into the recovery teams up there. You know, the guys looking for their missing in action. Um, and I told him, I said, uh, I went up to that site and this lieutenant or whatever it was, he, he goes, well, how'd you get there? I said, I walked. And he goes, you what? I said, we walked. It took us 10 days to get there. We spent three days there and came back. And uh, so I gave them a whole bunch of pictures and everything and let them work with it. So in 2017, they were going back into that crash site and they asked me if I wanted to go. And I said, yeah, most definitely. So I flew over to Hawaii. They trained me a little bit, which I really didn't need the training, but they, they trained me a little bit on ropes and stuff like that because I, I used to be a rock, mountain climber, rock climber, ice climber, did all that stuff, mountain climbing. Um, so anyway, so we went back up again up in there, and I was only going to be there for two out of the six weeks, and they were going to have me come back. But I worked with the guys, and the guys like me. You know, I, I'm, I'm young enough still. I mean, you know, I'm going at 78, but... <laughs> I was like almost oh, 70 years old, I guess. I don't know. But uh, I worked for them. I humped on down and um, I helped them shake and look for bones and everything else and found bullets from the, the vests of the pilots. And they had 38s, you know, um, found a bunch of other little goodies and stuff. Never found anything, you know, no bones or anything. But uh, then we came on I, when I was coming back after two weeks, they the this colonel came out and he goes, um, would you like to stay here a little longer? And I says, yeah, I'll stay here as long as you want. You can leave me here. I'll come, come back and get me next year. You know, so uh, they they asked me to stay. So I went back the next day on the choppers and flew up into the area there and landed and got out. And I spent another four weeks with them, working with them and stuff. They're a great bunch of guys. And uh, but I worked with them. I didn't go up there and just sit around. I, I worked my butt off and I lost 35 pounds. So I should go back. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, so I did that, and then I came back to the States, and um, and that was pretty much the end of that mission. They went back a couple of years ago, and they found dog tags of Alan Trent. It was Alan Trent and Eric Hoover with the two pilots, and they found Alan Trent's dog tags. And uh, But the, the minimalization in the soil up there really eats up a lot of the bones. But <clears throat> when I was up there in 2017, um, Stony Beach, uh, they they are in there and they gather information from people who come out and say, hey, we found an airplane or something. He goes in and evaluates it and then gets in the contact with uh, DPAA and they they work out missions. The um, when we're up there, uh, 
uh, up there. Um, he went on down. Uh, his name was Eric. He went on down and he was talking to the Vietnamese. And I told him, I said, hey, if you're going to go down there, let me draw you a map. So I drew a map of uh, where to look for the enemy, you know, from the battle. And um, he took that down and gave it to the Vietnamese because he spoke Vietnamese and Cambodian and everything. Um, they asked me, he said, where'd you get this map? He goes, uh, well, the guys, you, your guys were trying to kill us up there looking for the two pilots still. And he goes, oh, he goes, uh, Yes. Yeah. He says, we hunted in this area. He says, we found 126 remains so far, but we're still missing over 100. So there's over 226 people that were killed in that battle. You know, so, um, it, it, you know, I think that's that's so stupid. I don't know why the enemy don't just let you go in there and take out your your, your dead and leave, you know. So, um, I mean, why why get your own people killed for like that for, for people that, that are most likely dead or, you know, if they're not there, they're a prisoner. So, um, yeah, it's crazy. But uh, anyway, so that was pretty much the end of that mission. But um, I guess before I go, I guess you probably want to talk, want me to talk about pararescue. Um, so when I was in pararescue, what I did is I was, I joined the 12th group as a reserve team when I came back in 1971 from Vietnam. And the whole team uh, went into underwater operations. So they sent the whole team down the combat dive course, the scuba school. And um, so we did that. And I think they were a little easier on some of us because they didn't want the team to get separated, you know, because you can you can send like 12 guys down there or 13 guys down there. You know, you're going to have one or two that are going to fail because that's a tough school. But they, they were probably a little lenient on us a little bit. And we still had to do all the, the heavy swimming and everything else, carry all the boats and the, you know, the mooring lines and all that stuff. But we had to all do that and do all the push-ups and the flutter kicks. So anyway, the whole team passed, and uh, from but one day we were teaching uh, these guys in the Air Force, and uh, they were pararescue. And at the time, I didn't know what PJs were pararescue. I had no 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 idea. So um, we started talking to them, and I I went. This was up in Truckee, California, up in the mountains, and it was during the winter time. So I went down to this place called the Bar of America in Truckee, and um, it used to be the Bank of America, and they turned it into a bar, and uh, uh, Bob Herman and I went down there and we were talking and he was telling me everything that they, they did. And I'm going, are you kidding me? You guys really do all that? He goes, yeah, every week we're doing rescues practically. And so I went on down on my day off. I went on down at the time I was a police officer. So, and then I was working for a concrete well sign company for a while. And, but I went on down to them and uh, they showed me and then they had aerator scuba tanks and all kinds of stuff you know twin tanks and you know for jumping and they had twin 72s and single 72s for diving um all these parachute rigs and i mean their equipment was top notch climbing gear like you wouldn't believe and they gave us money we had dry suits all kinds of wetsuits all custom made and to fit to our body uh i mean just unbelievable stuff so i went back to to the to my team in special forces which is a314 of the 12th group and I, I i went up to jimmy gaston and i go uh hey jimmy i says uh i think i'm gonna leave and become a pj he goes you can't do that i go uh what do you mean he goes um he goes you're you're your family you gotta stay here i'm going jimmy i'm bored to death we're not doing anything i mean you know you don't want to, who wants to be in special forces if there's no war going on i mean it's that's like you know yeah, I'm this hardcore killer and I work in the bakery or something, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work, you know, so um, I went ahead and uh, he shows me my orders. He goes, you see these orders? I go, yeah, and I'm on this list, you know, and I had my orders for E8 and I'm going, I go, Jim, you know, I don't care about rank. I don't care about money. I just want to go have some, I want to do something. And um, he goes, well, and he tore up my orders. <laughs> so I go on down and talk to the guys in Peresca. They ran me for a training thing to make sure I could pass all the courses. You know, I did the push-ups. I don't know what it is, 500-yard swim or something. And you have to be able to go – you have to be able to swim underwater like 50 yards and back again underwater, like 100 yards on one breath of air. You can't break the surface. So I did that, and uh, I was still in really good shape. Um, I did 200 push-ups, 200 sit-ups, 200 jumping jacks every day. So, um, so I was in pretty good shape. And being a gymnast, you know, my muscles are pretty much trained to do all that kind of stuff. So I passed all that. And then I didn't have to go to uh, Lackland. So most PJs hate me for that. But I just tell them, I said, you didn't have to go to SOG either. <laughs> <Yeah, so. 
<laughs> so, but I have to go to Lackland because Lackland is Superman U and they go there for to get, build them up and make them strong so they don't fail scuba school or jump school or any other, you know. And uh, so for, uh, what I did is I went to Kirkland and um, that's like a pararescue university. And uh, they teach you all the medical, how to work on the helicopters, uh, work the H3s, 53s, and the C-130s and the Hueys. So they train you in all those aircraft. And um, uh, they do um, mountain climbing, uh, parachuting with full scuba gear, parachuting into the mountains with uh, tree, rough terrain parachuting and stuff. And I went to rough terrain parachute school in the Army. I, went, I was over in Okinawa when I went through that. Um, so yeah, we went for all those trainings and stuff. And um, uh, then I went back, I was with the 129th Aero Special Rescue Recovery Service out of, um, it was a National Guard group and I was full time with them. So I was there, I was in charge of the medical section. And uh, so the good thing was a lot of the guys were National Guard. So what they did is they, uh, they didn't live close by the camp. Some of them lived in Washington, some lived in Utah and they couldn't get there when a mission came up uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get on a lot of those missions. So I had a couple of, I had four jump missions. One was canceled. Actually, the, 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 the team leader, he was afraid that he, he, he quit. He, he had some children and he was afraid he, he didn't want to jump out of airplanes anymore because uh, he was afraid to get hurt. And he had these children and a wife. So, but uh, that one canceled. I, I offered to take over the team, but they wouldn't let me go on by myself. Uh, then uh, we had another one where uh we were going get ready to jump in and turn out they were drug dealers and they were sinking their own ship so they blew a hole in the bottom of the ship that's me going out the door and that's andy hale behind me so um uh they blew a hole in the ship and the ship was sinking but a couple of guys got injured and they wanted us to go out there and take care of the guys and uh so when we got there they found out that you know they had um they had um, you know, the law enforcement out there and Coast Guard out there. And they said, no, this is a drug dealing ship. We've been following it. And all these bales came off the ship and they're in the water. All these boats came in, picked up the bales. They only got about three of the boats. But uh, the, uh, I still would have jumped in. They were afraid they'd take me hostage. I said, I don't care. You know, let them take me hostage. I'll take their gun away and spank them, you know. But um so that that was one but the other two missions uh one was 1100 miles out at sea we flew out the guy had a um um a bowel, he had what was he had he had a bowel obstruct no he had a what was he had oh he had a, he had a, a ruptured appendix and this is uh this is my second jump where i'm giving the guy some uh um antibiotics and he's got it we're pumping into the lactated ringer but the um uh, anyway, so we fly out there about 1,100 miles, and, and there's there's this two C-130s and two H-3s. So we're flying out in the 130, and we parachute in, get in, and and the water it was 32 foot seas, which is friggin' unbelievable. I mean, it's peaking like this. The waves are going like this, you know, just peaking. And we got in the water. And I'm looking up at the top of the wave, and I'm not in the water yet. And so finally, I get in the water. I cut my parachute loose. You just cut the the canopy and let it sink, because uh, they're not going to be any good anymore. So then um, I'm I wait for the wait get to the crest of the wave so I can see where the dinghy is because the ship puts a dinghy in the water and the dinghy come and gets you. You don't try to parachute under the ship. But you get in the water and I saw the dinghy and I had to swim over to it with all this gear and like you see me on the twin tanks and a. And you know, and you got that package tray, pack tray back there for the chute that's wobbling around. Your raft and your medical gear. So you're swimming over to this dinghy. I finally get to the dinghy. Johnny um, uh, Johnny Stevens was was the team leader on that mission, and uh, he was already in the boat. They picked him up first. So I grab a hold of the side of the boat, and the wave comes up, and I can see all the way underneath the boat. The water was so rough. Then when the boat went down, it came came down sideways like this. I rolled right into the boat. And uh, so then I get in the boat and we're taking this over to the ship. So when I get to the side of the ship, you have to wait for the largest wave to get on that ship. So you, I waited for the largest wave because they have a ladder. There's a door on the side of the ship and they drop a ladder out. So you come up, you grab that ladder. And as soon as you grab that ladder, that boat's gone. It goes down like 30 feet. And so I'm climbing up and climbing in there and just vomiting. Uh, don't ever eat donuts when you're going to do one of those missions. I tell you, I was so seasick. So then Johnny, I'm waiting for Johnny to come up. 
he gets knocked off the ladder twice because he didn't get a big enough wave and he falls back into the boat thank goodness if he would have fell into because when that boat goes down sometimes it moves away from the ship and if he would have fell between them then we, we probably would have lost him but he went ahead and finally got a big enough wave and he gets in there and then on the way out what they're doing the other c-130 is refueling the helicopters coming out so they're they refuel like three or four times coming out that that distance because most choppers can't go out any more than like 300 miles you know whatever um that's why the coast guard didn't go out there the coast guard is only on the coast so their their shop their choppers aren't refuelable but the rescue swimmers are good guys you know uh, i like them the coast guard guys but uh so anyway they refuel it bring it all the way out and then they bring a hoist and one of the things when that hoist is coming down you you don't want to get near it because it'll arc especially with that it picks up so much static electricity in that rotor mm-hmm. you'll be a big old huge arc going from the deck to the to that uh that's uh pet jungle penetrator actually they put a stokes litter in it so they drop the stokes litter and there's a line on it so you can hold on to it so it doesn't spin we got the guy we put him in the in there and uh, brought him up into the shopper it was an h3 helicopter brought him up and then uh, once they get up there they take off the stokes litter and they put the uh, penetrator on it that comes down and we both get on it and then they bring us back up and uh, then we flew to coos bay oregon dropped him off and he was a 21 year old kid but his gut was so ex- distended from the gas building up so we had to refuel the helicopters at 100 feet off the water because you can't go up in altitude because it, it just expands the gas so anyway the uh, that was that mission and then we flew back to base in the choppers and then um uh, another mission i had we flew out there it was, it was another one it was about a thousand miles out it was for the sugar islander that brings the cnh sugar over from hawaii that one we flew out i was a team leader on it and that that was the picture of me going out the door with andy hill behind me and um that guy had a um a bowel obstruction an ingle and a hernia and a bowel obstruction probably you know coincide together and so we that one they decided we just got him stable and we decided to just stay on the ship and we took it all the way to hawaii because it was not that far from hawaii so we did that one and um i got a nice letter from the uh, the surgeon that um did that one i'll get to st helens here in a minute um but the, we took that guy in then we flew back on a on a jet and um you know and and you know we, on one of the generals jets they flew us back to california but then we had a christmas party to go to and so from there we went on back to the base um so that was a pretty good mission uh there's a lot more to it but i'm trying to cut them short the um uh, on mount st helens when that when that was getting ready to blow what it actually it did blow uh the guys up in oregon the rescue guys up there they were getting you know they were being overworked so they had a lot of teams coming out they had teams coming out from new york with that great big unit out there and uh and then our group came out this is right before it blew and and the uh, newspaper guys they they had pictures on a bulletin board and i took a picture of the pictures and this is right before it blew and um but we're up there looking for um the uh, you can see it's cracking you know the, we were looking for the um the sheriff's brother and oh. um, so we flew around out there looking for him we couldn't find anything the interesting thing is like where those trees are standing you see those trees on the ground uh on mount st helens and those pictures those trees are only like 50 feet from where they were where they were, they were standing though so they just went whoom like that and fell over from the shock wave but if you notice there's no tops on them and no branches on them and everything from that point for like about i don't know five or ten miles i don't know how i can't remember how far it is from those trees to that volcano that was all disintegrated just plain disintegrated and and then when it got weaker that's where the trees were laying down but it burned all the branches and the tops off the trees and uh, it looked like the moon out there and it looked like craters but the craters were from big chunks of ice being blown up and coming down and hitting the river had a bunch of you know like elk and deer and stuff in it, it had all these some of those trees looked like logs coming down they were there and it had mud flows like you wouldn't believe and uh, that was pretty devastating up there when i saw that i've said i've never seen anything like that that was just it was like hiroshima and nagasaki just completely wiped clean and um 
So from there, uh, I went to um, uh, uh, John Stevens and I. We bugged um, we bugged uh, NASA, telling him, you know, you know, you know, you guys are going to need some paramedics. So we kept talking to him, talking to him. And finally, they called us up and said, um, "We're going to be out White Sands training for the space shuttle. You want to come out?" And I said, "Oh yeah, we'll be there. Just when you want us there. How about tomorrow? We'll be there." So we got a C-130 to fly us out there, and we trained with the astronauts out there. Uh, it was Rhea Seddon, uh, who's married to Hoop Gibson, uh, Anna Fisher, the first mother in space, and Jim Bajan. They're all medical doctors, and they were astronauts. And um, so we trained with those guys out at White Sands. And then when it came to STS-1, 2, and 3, uh, we remote a contingency paramedics, which is uh, if the shuttle's a glider, when it comes down, it has no power. It's a glider. So if it, it has air brakes, like most gliders, it can, it can drop if it's going to be too long. And if, but if it's too short and they're not going to be able to pick it up, you know, pick up speed, then uh, they're going to have to bail out of it. So STS-1, 2, and 3 had ejection seats in it because it was just the two pilots. STS-1 was, um, um, oh, what was his name? John Young and Bob Crippen. STS-2 was Angles and Truly. STS-3 was... Lousmer and Fullerton. And so um, I, um, I, I met uh, Lousma, Jack Lousma. I, I've met him at the uh, Space Fest every once in a while, and he recognizes me now, except I cut my ponytail off, so I don't know if he's going to recognize me next time. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I see him at there and we talk. And then uh, Rhea Seddon, um, she remembers me, and uh, Anna Fisher remembers me. I took a bunch of pictures. I've got a picture on my Facebook where Anna Fisher's yelling at me. Stop taking pictures. Come over here and learn something. You know, so, but now she likes those pictures. I, I gave her the pictures. I said, I've got copies so you can have them. So, but uh, that's what we did on the space shuttle. We worked with those guys. Uh, STS-3 landed in uh, with Lousma Fulton. They landed in White Sands. The first two landed in um, uh, Edwards Air Force Base. But the STS-4 had an additional pilot an additional uh load specialist or something and so um they decided to disconnect the ejection seats so after that they they had to write it in or whatever and so it's tragic when they lost the, those two one coming in and one leaving but um but anyway so i worked with the space shuttle and stuff did a lot of hoist wow. missions did a lot of hoist missions going out in the ocean you know going down the ship and those are ones where you, when it comes out they're they're not they might only be like 500 miles out or something but when you get out there you know you, that rotor's picking up a lot of a lot of ro rotation you know uh, static electricity so when you're getting close to the ship you want to jump off that penetrator and one time i didn't get off fast enough and it arced between the deck and my foot and it'll it'll knock your fillings out of your head yeah <laughs> but you learn you learn once <laughs> once it happens you don't do it again but um, but I tried to get off. I just didn't get off soon enough. Um, did those? Um, uh, let me see. I had one where we were doing a training mission at night one time, and the and the H uh, three it was at night. And what they do is uh, we we they flew by, we jumped in the water, and then they come back around and they pick you up. And what they do is they drop flares out on the water, and that keeps them because if you look at a pattern on a helicopter when it's in the water, wherever that chopper goes the pattern stays there so they can get disoriented real easy, especially mm -hmm. with the waves going up and down. So at night, what they do is they look at those flares, but if the flares drop down between a wave and they lose it, you know, they can get disoriented. And um, what is it they get? Um, uh, spatial. Uh, uh, spatial disorientation, but there's another name for it. But anyway, the, um, anyway, we're, we're, they came by, they dropped the, the Stokes litter. Uh, not the Stokes, the uh, the uh, jungle penetrator, and we Very put out paddles. And Bill uh, Bill Thompson and I got on it. And we we're about halfway up, and all of a sudden he got disoriented. The vertigo, chopper, vertigo. He just yeah. got vertigo and came right straight down on top of us. Just dropped the chopper right in the water, and so we got off the thing and we swam as far as we could out to the side to make sure that rotor he didn't tilt and the rotor didn't hit the water. So, uh, but they, they float so. Anyway, we got up and we saw the chopper there, and he's he managed to get it stable and bring it back up again. So he flew around, came back again. And we got on, we swam over to it, got on it, and they just 
jacked us right up there so friggin' fast. They slammed us into the bottom of the chopper trying to get us in. But um, yeah, that was a kind of a cool thing. Um, you know, just all adventure. I love adventure. Uh, that's about it. So after the, after I left pararescue, I went to school, became a doctor, and I'm a, I'm a radiologist, and uh, I'm retired now. Um, that's where I got all the money to go back to um, uh, Cambodia for the, when I went back there. Um, so when I retired, I started studying meteorites for many years. You had that one question. So what I did is um, I started collecting them, learning about them, and then I started going out hunting for them. And I still go out and hunt for them. I sell them on eBay unless it's one that the universities don't have. I'll slice it up and give a slice to the universities. Uh, or I give I give a lot to the Vatican in uh, Vatican City, you know, in Italy. Uh, I'm friends with um, both of the the brothers that are in there. The, um, um, Bob Mackey is one of the guys now, and uh, one of the the other guy is um, Guy Consolmagno. Mm -hmm. and guy and I are pretty close friends. So, but I give them meteorites. This one here, I called the Delaney Stone. I named it after my uh, granddaughter. It's the first meteorite I found. It was 13 inches under the ground. And I just gave that to her. I just gave it to her as uh, she's 13 now. So I gave it to her. So um, she's a ballet dancer. And so we got, so she, I gave that one to her as a gift. And I've got some pieces of the moon. Here's a, I can pull it out. I got pieces of the moon here you can see that's so oh wow yeah that's a piece Holy of the moon uh, it, it's a small piece i mean that little piece there's like 500 dollars. but um i'm giving Ooh. that to my grandkids i got three of them sitting here i'm gonna i got three grandchildren i'm gonna give them those and that's the one there it's all cleaned up and it's oriented you can see where the ridge is on there and you can see the rigmaliffs or thumb printing off to the sides I looked all over for the the rest of it. I couldn't find the rest of it. Um, it probably had a couple of pieces, but that one there is about seven thousand years old. Wow! It came, yeah, it came down around seven thousand years ago, and uh, but it, it's called Franconia, and it's it's a nice piece. It's named after um, uh, a, a train station in northern Arizona. They name meteorites at, uh, to the closest spot. They usually do the closest post office. But if the post office is too far away, then what they do is uh, this here is like they, they name it after a basin. This is gold basin here. These are all little pieces that we found. And uh, I think, we, uh, my buddy and I spent out went spent two weeks out there looking for him. So so that that's kind of the Zynga. That's <laughs> yeah. So my buddy's pretty good at hunting meteorites and uh, those are his on the one side, and I just found three. He found five. <laughs> wow. So we, that, we, I mean, and, that is so cool. Yeah, and we just, uh, we I sell them on eBay and stuff like that. Wow. Um, I've got some big ones. I've got, I've got big meteorites. So. Oh, I've, I've seen a big few fire. of your big, your big ones. Um, Guys, this is a funny photo I wanted to show you all. Franklin Miller that I just found with the nunchucks and John Plast with a, a dagger here and them practicing but um i was uh before we close up i wanted to to read some names off along with yours i've just found the team roster for the year you were there and it's quite long but i, I just wanted to show people or uh let people see how many sog men were actually with you at uh uh a502 um oh at a502 yeah yes sir we got uh We've got George Cottrell, who was uh, CCN. Uh, he may, I, I think he was at two, but I know CCN for sure. Um, well, I, I can go through these. The, the first guy, Tony Abrahams, that's Anthony Abraham. Tony mm -hmm. Abraham, he, he's the guy that had the candy stripe. He's, um, he was a really nice guy. I think he opened up a commercial golf golf course because he was really big in the golf. But he wanted to get uh, go to jump school. So I went down to Dong Batin with him and jumped with him. And that's where I got my jumps in Dong Batin. Uh, Don Bemis, he died. Um, uh, John Carlson, John Carlson was with um, Frank Miller and um, oh, uh, who was the other guy who was with him? Uh, he died. He he had a white phosphorus gun, grenade go off. And Chuck Hines down here. His Chuck name Hines. is listed. Yeah. Yeah, Chuck Hines. Um, but uh, yeah, Chuck 
and John Carlson and Miller all came together. And uh, John Carlson, he was killed. He was killed there while he was there. Uh, Cooper, let's see, Cut uh, is that Cottrell? Or Cut Cottrell. George, George Cottrell. I think that's George Cottrell. Yeah, he, he was uh, a and John, vet. Yeah, that's right. George Cottrell and John Cottrell, they both died in accidents, car accidents when they got back. Uh, I think John was the younger guy. George George was the older guy. I ran a couple of missions with them. They're good guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Crabtree was the asshole I told you about, the captain that got on my case for having the minigun. Um, Deschamps, uh, he was a, a lieutenant. He was a good guy. Uh, those guys never went out in the field. They stayed in the main camp. Um, let's see. Let me see. It probably help if I put my glasses on. Oh, here we go. Um, Donnell, I uh, didn't Downs East. Dave uh, Dave Eastburn was um, long range recon. Uh, uh, Pete Estrada, uh, he was a combo guy. He was a good guy. Uh, George Funk, I think George passed away. George was a good guy. He was a, he was one of our medics uh gabhart uh he became he's the guy that became the um uh uh forest ranger uh john gigliotti uh, i remember him and um oh it was another guy oh i'll tell you a funny thing about uh gigliotti and george funk um they were on our mission and uh i was it was my day off so i was gonna go down and you know i went to the main camp i was gonna get cleaned up and go downtown and you know and have my spend my night down there and uh, our CO is there. They had a football game going on. So uh, the major goes, uh, Major John McBride, he goes, um, hey, Jim, I'm glad you're here. He says, you're going to bang on this team over here. I go, and I don't play football. I said, I was a gymnast. I don't play football. Don't play baseball, none of that stuff. And uh, he goes, well, you know, make a long story short, he goes, you either play football or you're going to go out in the field and bring Gig and, uh, and uh, uh, George Funk back. So I said, well, call on the chopper. So they called the chopper in. I got in the chopper. I went on out there and uh, I took George's backpack and what food he had left. I had my rifle and ammo and uh, they came back and played football and I went and finished the mission. <laughs> True story. So let's see. That's uh, uh, let's see. Eastburn, Strata Funk, Gigliotti, Guerrero. I don't know who that is. Uh, Hearst. Uh, yeah, he was an OK guy. Um, Hefferman, that's Bill Hefferman. He was the one that was at A5 uh, on Suiyao with me. And then Chuck Hines. Um, George Hoffman, that's Sonny Hoffman. And then uh, Fred Horn. I ran into Fred Horn. We were on a mission one time. We helped him out. They got into a battle. We, we helped him out with the battle. And uh, it was up in, um, up in the Dongbo Valley. And, uh, but I ran into him. He came back to the States and was working with... Um, uh, uh, ROTC or something like that. Uh, but I ran into him one time in California and uh, he was a good guy. Fred Horn was a good guy. I don't think he was SF qualified either. I think he was attached and, but he, he ended up burning the beret. Uh, Jenkins, I think was our early team sergeant. And I don't know who that next guy is, Jim Jones. Uh, Tom Kemmer, Tom Kemmer was, um, uh, he was the third man to get a purple heart in Vietnam. He was the enlisted man in charge of the Sante raid with Bull Simon. He was enlisted. Oh. Man. Um, so Tom Cameron, when my camp was, they got word my camp was going to get overrun. Tom came down and spent the night with me. And uh, he said, we're just going to sit here back to back. If the enemy comes, we're going to knock them out one by one. And um, he said, tell all you guys to wear a hat. If nobody's wearing a hat, we're going to kill them. So then <laughs> nothing happened that night. He went back and it was about two weeks later I got overrun. Um Kirby, uh, Wycliffe B. I don't know. I don't remember him. Gene Lindsay was a good guy. He was more like a flower child, but he was a good guy. And John McBride, he was the team leader. He was a major McBride. Good guy, real nice guy. He was a short guy, thin with uh, red hair. He ended up going to the first group over in Okinawa from there. McCandless, I know the name. I can't place him. Lou Merletti became the director of the Secret Service. Uh, and Mike Micah, that's the guy that uh, he got the orders from me and him to go there. And then you got Frank Miller um, and James Mitchum. He was a good guy. James Mitchum was a real cool guy. Uh, he was he was a small guy like myself. 
Um, Overby, I don't remember. Uh, Tom Payne was a really good guy. He's a lieutenant, real nice guy. And then Jim Roush was first lieutenant. Uh, he got a he got the uh, commission. He was an enlisted man and got got commissioned. Um, oh, and Sagnella, Eugene Sagnella. Um, I remember when we were down, we were turning over. I, I went down to this uh, this other little camp they had down there. And I was watching the TV and we're watching a news guy and he wanted, I had a cat house gun. It was a little, uh, 30, 32, uh, uh, Colt 32 pistol. And I used to wear it around my neck and I took that when I went downtown, but Eugene took, takes it. He takes, he, he, he cocks it back to look at the, to see if there's anything in the chamber, lets it go. And then he takes the magazine out and I looked at him and says, Eugene, you just put it around the chamber. And just as I'm telling that. He's looking at the newsman on the TV and he goes, I'll get you, you dirty guy. Boom. And he shot the TV. <laughs> and, but he, Eugene was, he was a weapons guy. He, he, I don't know, so funny. But he was a good, cool guy. And then uh, Sheridan, I remember him. Harlow Shirt was our medic. George Shutley, I can't remember him. Uh, Gary Stuckey was, see, uh, see. I went with me. And Gary was a long range recon guy. And uh, we got his beret. We got his beret for him at um, at the at SOAR one one year. We got him his beret. Got him his orders. They okayed it through the through the special forces channel. Wow. And then Jim Tolbert. He was a singer. He, he used to write music and stuff. And uh, he was a pretty nice guy. I don't think he even went out in the field much, but he was a nice guy. I think he was on a previous A team. Went out in the field. And that's about that's about it on those guys. Wow! Holy cow! What a awesome run through on that i'm glad uh you've got oh, a heck of a memory george funk i think i'm not sure if it was lou merletti but i think i think lou merletti married george funk's sister i think it was like either that or george funk married lou merletti's sister i don't know this is there's, there's a family relation there wow okay and, wow. Lou and i lou and i keep in touch we talk to each other just about every day on on uh, emails uh, he's uh, he sounds especially uh, in the book uh, Annie Jacobson wrote. He sounds like he is quite the interesting man. I would uh, I'd love to bend his ear one day if uh, it ever comes up. He he sounds well, like he's quite. There's a news reporter that did an interview with him because uh, you know Lou is about my size. He's not a real tall guy, um, but just a brilliant guy. You know, I wish I would have known he was in there. My son wanted to get into the Secret Service. And I didn't know Lou was a director. You know, but my my son now is a he's the top special agent for the Attorney General of Nevada. Oh, and he's been in the police department, the sheriff's department, uh, state troopers. He's been in all of them. He just didn't like him. He likes what he's doing now, um, but his love is to teach, and he wants to go back to teaching. And my daughter works for the sheriff's department in Carson City, Nevada. Wow. Okay. A son, family full of. And you were actually a cop for quite a while or, as well. No, I was a cop for a little, little over a year. I, I got my first year post and got out. I, I didn't like, I couldn't, I didn't like some of the guys I worked with. You know, they're all like fighting to get to be sergeants and stuff like that. And I didn't care. I just wanted teamwork. And they stuck me with the guy that saved a police officer's life. And the guy could do no wrong. And after I left the PD, my buddy told me, he says, uh, you're not going to believe it, but they kicked him out of the PD. I go, what for? He says, for abusing his wife. Oh, so, Lord. But, uh, mm. I mean, there were some good guys in the San Jose. I was in the San Jose Police Department, San Jose, California. But uh, there were some good guys in there. Lumpy Lumberg, uh, uh, Dan Bullock. Um, I knew a lot of guys that were great, great officers, really super nice. Uh, I worked in a sporting goods store right before that, and they used to come in and tell me to come in and, you know, sign up for the PD. So there was, I don't know how many how many people signed up. Um I think there was 600 people signed up for it and as only six 30 of us or i think 30 of us that got chosen to go for the training so i went through but um after dealing with this guy named ivan chapel i couldn't deal with it i just i got out i mean these guys worshipped him i go man i said look he saved the guy's life i said just pat him on the back and say job well done and move on and you, you don't don't worship the guy Jeez. yeah there isn't an officer there that wouldn't have done the same thing free uh can't can't coast on that the rest of your career you gotta keep keep doing it every day i i can see how that that would not have been a a a good good fit for you being in a, a situation like that um 
Yeah. Uh, and then I got a divorce. And when I got a divorce is when I left the army and, and the air force and stuff. Wow. Um, Two great kids. And I had a great wife. She was good. It was my fault. It wasn't hers. She's a good woman. We're still friends. That's good. That's good. Um, and, uh, that, that very good to hear about your, your kids and, and what, what they're doing as well. Um, I'm sure, uh, with, with all the new people that we've had today, uh, I'm sure we'll end up having to have you back. Um, will you, uh, is there anything you'd like to close on before we finish up for the day? No, I, that's my uh -oh. phone. No, I, um, I, uh, I thank everybody for asking questions. I wish I could have answered some more questions. Let me turn this thing off. See what it is. Oh, heck. Yeah. It's my buddy. It's my buddy I go on cruises with. <laughs> what time is it anyway? It is 210. We've been on for two hours and 30 minutes. Yeah, it's one. I got one 110. So he must have just got out of bed. <laughs> He's a medical doctor. Oh, he's, he's been tired. hard at work then. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely have you back because I know uh, people, uh, the new viewers, and we had a lot of good questions. So uh, we'll definitely want to have you back for sure. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get to answer a lot of more, a lot more questions and stuff. But um, uh, yeah, tell everybody out there, you know, uh, push for me to get on those other guys with, um, <laughs> you know, I, Jack Carr and uh, Ryan and um, what's his name? Um, Sean, Jack, uh, John Ryan, you, Jack you know, Carr, and Mike Glover. We're we're gonna get uh, we're gonna start flooding their Twitter and their Instagrams, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get get you on there one way or that. We'll start our own little private uh, crowd crowd campaign service to to get you on. So I've got a buddy. I've got a buddy that uh, was with CAG or Delta or something. Uh, he's um, actually he's in for the Medal of Honor. And uh, he know those guys. He knew those guys when he was in. Oh wow! Yeah, I've, he told me some interesting stuff about them. They're good guys. Uh, oh yeah, I, I love when they share some of their history, especially early on in all their pictures. They are they were quite the guys. They definitely followed in y'all's your your footsteps. Uh, in the yeah, they, in they the kinda, special... like, think we're great guys and stuff. I you know I don't think anything I did was really good. But you know one thing I heard was that. Uh, they won't let them do the missions like we did. No, so we God lost, no. Yeah, we lost 50% of our guys. 50% of us were killed. And uh, we were all wounded, you know, wounded more than once. You know, I, I, I was wounded on three times in the Army and one time in the Navy. When I was in the Navy, I woke up in the China Beach Hospital. And I woke up and there's this Purple Heart laying next to me. And I, I'm going, what's this? He goes, that's your Purple Heart. I, thought, I don't want it. Get it out of here like that and this marine laying next to me was saying you earned it i go i don't want that thing i wasn't hurt enough get it get it out of here <laughs> so they took it back so um, i don't know if my records or not you know because uh the navy records got burned up in missouri in a fire so i don't know if it's in there or not yeah yeah that that's always that i hate hearing when the records and and the pictures and all of that got burned um there is one question before we close that uh someone's been wanting to find out and i have no idea what this is about um wally coyote um uh, it's some kind of program or uh wiley coyote did what he did to ultimately save american lives his actions eventually led to the ending of the conflict which was supposed to be an endless war to benefit the... military industrial complex. I don't know. I, don't I know think he's, is. yeah, I think, uh, I'm not like sure if he's, involved. I'm not sure if this is a secret, uh, program or a conspiracy program that maybe they've read in the books, but on all of the SOG stuff, I have not heard anything about wally coyote or is that a no-go zone we don't know what you're talking about uh Keith, um, was you well, I... there's a lot of guys that not a lot of guys but a few guys wrote some books about sog but it was um it was before we could actually talk about sog and they wrote these fic fiction books mm -hmm. uh, and that might have been something in one of those books i heard conflicting reports about several sog vets what happened with Wiley Coyote? 
um we we, all we Yes, he went on to the cartoon business or something. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say I have running after Rose not, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I I was about to let's see if anything came up. Yeah, uh, they're indicating it's early, maybe during like Roadrunner or the the Leaping Lena project. But I I hate to say it, he could be trying uh uh trolling me and and I, uh I doing think, a Wally Coyote joke. <laughs> I think they did have uh, Roadrunner teams. But mm -hmm. from what I understand, I think they were Vietnamese. Yes, sir. All uh, it, very early on with Project Delta, and it did not. It worked uh, fairly well, but not, not uh, not very well. And that's when uh, Delta went full American, and then Sog on. Uh, he claims it's directly straight from Sog veterans. I'll uh, I'll start asking around, Keek, but I have never. Uh, heard anything about that in my seven or eight years of speaking to the men uh not once read about it heard about it seen anything about it but i'll start looking even more um, yeah i've never and heard maybe it. maybe mr jim if he hears about it he'll let me know i'll start asking around but um without uh further ado i'm about to go grab myself some lunch for the day um i want to thank you for for coming on and spending the afternoon with us we always enjoy having you you're one of uh crowd favorite on this and the other podcasts and we're going to get you on Jocko, Mike's, Sean's and Jack Cars for sure. So awesome. I've got a look we've, we've got we've got a little uh the little crowdsource going on right now. So awesome. um <laughs> we will uh I'll stay in touch with you and uh I hope you have a great afternoon and we'll talk soon. You got it. Hey thanks guys. I appreciate everybody and may God bless you all and Merry Christmas. Absolutely. God bless sir. See you later. Bye bye.